The scientific revolution starts now. I'm Scott Turner. I'm a retired professor of biology. I uh, spent my academic career just outside of Syracuse. I'm a physiologist by training, which means I'm interested in the mechanisms whereby life works. Uh, and there's endless fascinating details in that. And that's kind of what's motivated me. But uh, there is one big question that uh, I've been pursuing uh, through my career, um, namely that uh, what is it that the science of physiology, that is how life works, has to say about the science and mechanism of evolution, which of course is tied into the history of life on Earth. And, and that's been the major question that has animated me uh, throughout my career, actually. Um, uh, a big part of the connection there is the phenomenon of adaptation, uh, which is, uh, if you break that down, uh, the et etymology of it, it it's it means a tendency towards apt function that is function which fits into an environment or fits into whatever circumstances that a living system happens to find itself in and um and that has led me to try to build a connection between physiology and evolution that is through the phenomenon of adaptation that's that's uh, pretty much occupied most of my research career what are the mysteries that still remain in the mysteries? The, yeah, the mysteries of evolution. You know, I think a lot of people come through school and they're like, well, it's an established theory. We pretty much understand how everything works. And, and I, yeah, that's, I have, I have a follow up to that once we get there. Okay. Um, w one of the things that I've been led to is that the established and widely accepted uh, ideas about evolution, namely the Darwinian idea, uh, which has gone through its own evolution since uh, Charles Darwin himself was grappling with the issue, is that uh, it's not really very explanatory. Uh, uh, to give you an example, um, uh, the modern concept of evolution is built around the uh, selection of so-called apt function genes, that is, whatever whatever genetic specifiers there are of apt function, it's going to be those particular genes that will be selected for transmission onto the next generation. And the relentless um, uh, selection of that, uh, which supposedly leads to adaptation, um, is the foundation of the modern Darwinian idea of evolution. Um, the trouble is, is that it doesn't really well, it doesn't account for a number of things. For example, um, how do you define an apt function gene to be selected? Well, you define it as that gene which is selected. And so you get into this kind of uh, empty uh, circular reasoning that doesn't really get to the question of where uh, adaptation comes from. And um, there's a 19th century um, paleontologist, uh, Edward Drinker Cope, he's very famous for uh, helping to open up the fossil beds of the badlands of uh, South Dakota and North Dakota. And it was uh, really the establishment, well, he was behind the uh, establishment of American paleontology as a first, as a world-class phenomenon. And of course, he was uh, in a very intense competition with another paleontologist, Othniel Marsh, and uh, they engaged in um, what was called the Bone Wars. And I think if anyone is interested in the history of science, uh, have a look at some of the history of the Bone Wars. But coming back to Cope, he, he posed the question of uh, evolution and adaptation in uh, a very, uh, I think, penetrating way. You know, he 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 said, "Well, never mind the origin of species. This was in the 1870s. Never mind the origin of species. What's the origin of fitness?" And uh, this ties into this whole issue of, well, where does fit function, apt function, come from? And when you come to essentially the gene selectionist idea that underlies modern Darwinism. Um, it's empty. You cannot uh, you cannot identify an at function gene except for for selection, except by it being selected, and and that is a fundamental problem. Um, it also rests on uh, a kind of 
a simplistic view of what the gene is, um, how it works, how uh, genetic memory fits into um, an organism's uh, function and adaptation, and uh, and and so to me, modern Darwinism is an empty theory, and I say that. Because uh, when I was younger, I was actually quite a staunch Darwinist. I I used to like uh, to open uh, seminars with uh, with a Valentine's Day card that I came across. It was a picture of Darwin and an I heart Darwin. That was that was very much me. I was uh, I was very much into that. And over the course of my career and my research, uh, I decided that no, this 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 doesn't explain very much, and there has to be an alternate way of uh, dealing with evolution. And so that's kind of a nutshell uh, sketch of of, uh, of 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 how I've come to think about evolution. What were the specific things that you found that made you start to question it? Um, my most of my uh, research interests uh, through most of my academic career was on um, an interesting problem in uh, social physiology, as I'll call it. Um, uh, there are these termites that live in southern Africa. Uh, they build immense mounds. You can see them on uh, websites, on nature programs, uh, uh, so forth, because they're quite a spectacular part of the landscape down in that region of the world. And uh, th this is the countries of uh, uh, South Africa, uh, Namibia, Botswana, um, that whole uh, area down there, including Zimbabwe and, of course, uh, Mozambique and and uh, Zambia and those places, basically any place where arid savannas are on the southern African subcontinent. And these mounds, they're very fascinating. They're huge. And I got interested in them because uh, they're not actually the habitations for the colony. The colony, which consists of about 2 million individual worker termites plus the queen and various uh, uh, kinds of uh, uh, hangers on to her her, uh, her uh, retinue. Uh, they don't live in that mound. Uh, they live in a in a constructed nest that is located about a meter to a meter and a half underground. And if if they're not living in it, why are they building it? Why are they going to all this trouble to build it? And just to give you an example of, of, or an illustration of just how much effort goes into this, uh, this basically is sand and clay and uh, termite feces and termite saliva and so forth. This thing is constructed out of it. And, and so uh, as a consequence, you know, wind and rain and uh, those kinds of things, they tend to erode the mound away, as you would expect them to. And we got interested one year in figuring out, well, just how much soil is moving through this mound. You know, uh, if you follow them year to year, which uh, we were able to do, they look pretty similar from year to year. Um, and yet this erosion is going on. So we figured, well, uh, there has to be some soil being transported up into this mound by the termites to help maintain its shape in the face of this uh, erosion. So as I said, we got very interested in understanding how much soil was moved. And it ended up um, coming out to about 250 kilograms, a quarter ton of soil is moved through these, uh, is moved through these mounds uh, every year. Um, and again, this just um, intensifies the question, if they're not living in it. Why are they going to all this trouble? It takes a great deal of effort for all these termites to be able to maintain this mound structure in the face of this relentless uh, erosion going on from the elements. And uh, I approach this as a physiologist, uh, namely, how what's its function? It has to have a function. Uh, uh, how does it work? How does it carry out its function? And what's going into maintaining its function, its structure that allows it to uh, engage in this function? And what we concluded was that uh, this is basically a large lung for the colony. Uh, if you, um, you know, you're talking about a colony of two million termites or so. They also cultivate a fungus. Fungi consume oxygen just like we do. The termites uh, consume oxygen as well. And if you look at the amount of oxygen consumption that these termite 
colonies go through, it amounts to the same kind of oxygen consumption that you would expect in an animal uh, ranging anywhere from the size of a goat to the size of a cow. And, and of course, uh, if you buried a goat or a cow under the ground, um, it wouldn't last very long. It would suffocate because it can't get the oxygen it needs and it couldn't get rid of the carbon dioxide that it needs to eliminate. And uh, what this colony does, well, sorry, what this mound does to get around this question is they build this immense, basically, lung that's constructed out of clay and sand and, and termite spit and so forth. And uh, as I said, there's a lot of soil movement that goes on in there. And so we um, spent a lot of time uh, working out just how these things pull off this function. Uh, part of it is the maintenance of a particular kind of a structure. Um, if you, uh, we have some, um, we did some work in collaboration with a colleague of mine from uh, Nottingham in the UK uh, named Rupert Soar. And um, he, he did something that only engineers can do. He, he uh, actually said, well, let's figure out the function by filling the entire thing full of plaster and then we'll slice it off one one millimeter at a time and we'll take photographs and put them together into a 3d model of what the structure is and the complexity of the structure is is mind-boggling and these termites are building this incredibly uh, complicated structure but it's not just complicated it's complicated towards a particular end which is to capture wind energy to be able to power the gas exchange to make it function as a lung uh, in our own bodies, for example, that power comes from the muscles of the ribs, the muscles of the diaphragm, and so forth. But these termites, instead of using muscle power to do this, they figure out a way to capture wind energy to be able to actually power uh, uh, power the exchange of respiratory gases. And that is a mind-boggling problem to me. You know, here you have physiology that not only uh, emerges de novo from uh, basically construction of a structure by these termites. Uh, individually, they're not very smart, but collectively, they manage to pull off this this uh, the, this um, this uh, uh, structure that has a particular kind of ordered complexity that enables that structure to perform a physiological function, just like our own lungs do just like uh, any other uh, organ system in the body does, and in fact, just uh, like every cell in the body does. And so... Is this just I through passive management of the turbulence and so forth? I mean, how, how is this how's this structure working? Because, you know, you, you said it's not an active process. They're really just harnessing these, I guess, yeah, wind gradients in nature. Yeah. How's yeah. that actually managed? Uh. There's actually a very interesting substory there as well. These these termite colonies are are um, are very famous because in the 1960s, a group of um, uh, Swiss entomologists uh, proposed a theory whereby these things acted to regulate the temperature of the nest underground, and mm -hmm. the reasoning behind this was that. Um, um, the colony itself produces uh, heat on the order similar to, say, a 100-watt incandescent light bulb or uh, 250 watts, anywhere from 100 to 250 watts. And these biologists uh, propose that, okay, well, this is a local heat source. This is going to set up a convection current within the mound, similar to what you would get if you put a space heater in the middle of a room. You get kind of a helical movement of air there. And they propose that, well, okay, the heating of this colony actually lofts buoyant warm air up into the nest, or sorry, I beg your pardon, up into the mound. And then this circulates around through superficial tunnels uh, that are built by the termites. And in this way, they said that, well, this is a means of uh, emergent homeostasis, uh, self-regulation. The hotter it gets, the more vigorous the circulation, the more heat will be dumped across the surface um uh, tunnels of the mound okay beautiful idea it held sway for uh, literally decades and i was uh pardon the interruption but we need to ask a favor 
If you've been watching the podcast and you are enjoying the conversations that we bring out into the world, consider coming over to patreon.com slash demystifysci and donating a couple dollars a month to the podcast. In return, you get each episode early. You get it on Saturdays instead of having to wait for Monday and Thursdays. And you also get to join our Patreon community, which gathers every Sunday on Zoom, where we have people talking about the big questions that they have about the world, sharing stories about their experiences with life and science, and we generally just investigate closely the topics that are most interesting to our growing community. If you can't donate, that's totally fine. You can join our Facebook, you can join our Discord, you can join our YouTube channel by subscribing to it, you can leave a comment, you can tell a friend about the podcast. Any little bit that you can do to help spread the word about Demystify Sci is super, super valuable to us, and we hope that you will do so. I had to take a temporary uh, one-year position at one of the South African homelands universities. And so I decided to set up a a, uh, uh, a field experiment for my students to show them this wonderful story. And so I rigged up a few little instruments and put them in there. And I couldn't find any movements of air in there that corresponded to this beautiful theory. And that's what kind of set me on on trying to understand the physiology of this structure. Now, uh, that theory being wrong, we couldn't find, we tested various aspects of it. Uh, we couldn't find any evidence that it was true. Mm. And so we set about working on how to do it. And um, what we finally concluded is that the uh, gas exchange function of the termite mound is very similar to the kind of function that we have in our own lungs. And the, the structures of the air passages in our lungs are kind of similar in a way to the structure of the air passages within the mound itself. And this is going to get a little, little, little bit complicated. So I'm going to ask you to bear with me while I describe this. Our most obvious awareness of our function of breathing is the inward and outward flow of air through the upper respiratory passages, the trachea and the bronchi and so forth. But it's actually that's actually not the end of the story. If you look at where the gas exchange actually takes place, it's in tiny little pockets within the lung called alveoli. And there's no in and air movement of air into and out of the alveoli. What governs uh, the gas exchange between the alveoli, air spaces of the alveoli and the blood is diffusion, differences of oxygen concentration and so forth. Up in the upper respiratory passages, it's convection, an entirely different uh, process of, of, of movements of material. It's bulk flows of air uh, in and out and so forth. And within sandwiched between the convection-dominated part of the lung and the diffusion-dominated part of the lung, namely the alveoli, you have this zone of mixed diffusion convection going on there. And what actually controls the movement of, say, oxygen from the atmosphere actually into your blood is how difficult it is to get uh, oxygen molecules across this mixed regime area between diffusion and convection. All right, so that's the that's that's one part of the technical issue. Now, um, what happens in the termite mound is very similar. You have three air spaces, like uh, we uh, have in our own lungs, three gas exchange regimes, actually. Uh, you have a convection regime, which is uh, the large... Um, uh, surface conduits, if you will, uh, actually the mound itself, the air spaces within the mound. And then you have the gas exchange, well, where the actual transfer of oxygen into living things takes place. That's actually in the nest itself. That's analogous to, if you will, to the um, to the alveoli of the lung. And then you have this mixed regime region between the nest, which is deep underground, and the uh, air spaces in the mound, which of course is above ground. Now, wind plays an important part of this because the mound surface is porous. And when wind flows past the uh, mound itself, some of that wind energy, this is mass in motion, this kinetic energy is going to penetrate across the porous surfaces of the mound. And that's going to stir the uh, air spaces within the mound itself. All right. 
if you look at the colony itself, the termites' lives are dedicated to preventing movements of air. You know, they hate movements of air, and uh, and uh, and they will work like crazy to prevent any kind of bulk movement of air going on through their colonies. And what's going to determine gas exchange is how effectively the uh, mound airspace and the nest airspace are mixed. And this is driven by wind, okay? And so that's basically how it works. Uh, uh, just as in our lungs, the rate of gas exchange is limited by this mixed regime area there. The same kind of thing happens within the termite colony itself. Well, the whole termite superorganism, if you will, the mound, the nest, and then the uh, sort of mixed regime region uh, in sandwich in between, how effectively uh, that mixed regime region is actually mixed by stirring of air within the mound. Now, um, I, so the mound is, I, is it sealed? There's, there aren't actual conduits? No, there are conduits. It's 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 permeated through, as I said, this extensive network of internal tunnels, and they have a kind of a similar architecture to what happens in our own lungs: very large passages branching into smaller and smaller and smaller passages until you end up uh, with a terminal um, uh, thing in the alveoli. In the case of the lung, and but in terms of like exposure to the to the outside air, there there aren't uh, there. You said that they try to limit the bulk flow of air. Yeah, that's right, and and uh, uh, this is one of the interesting uh, things about this. You know, the 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 surface of the termite mound itself is porous. All right, and and so uh, you can get. Uh, if wind happens to uh, flow past a uh, a mound, for example, you set up a distribution of pressure uh, on the surface of the mound, and that can actually uh, penetrate into the mound airspace as well and stir that airspace there. Okay, and uh, and so um, so you do get you know the penetration of wind energy into the mound airspaces uh, themselves, um, and so. Um, uh, there's an additional technical uh, thing we need to talk about, namely, uh, if you look at the structure of turbulent wind, it's very chaotic. The velocity changes all the time. Uh, we know this from personal experience. We can feel it by standing out into a into a uh, into an airstream of wind, for example. And this is the kind of paradox for the nest. The termites hate those kinds of bulk movements of air. They will do anything to stop them. And yet they depend upon bulk movements of air inside the nest itself. And bear with me here. The wind energy varies all the time with time. All right. It varies up and down. That's the nature of turbulent wind. The termites hate that. They hate that. And so part of the structure of the uh, mound itself is to take that turbulent energy that penetrates into the mound itself and to damp those fluctuations until it's nice and still in the nest itself. And so that's part of what's going on. That's the most technically, that was the most technically challenging part uh, for us to uh, uh, figure out. Now, to give you an illustration of how much termites hate this, you can poke a hole in the mound itself you know it's easy to do you just take an auger or a pickaxe or whatever and you poke a hole in it what that does is it introduces a portal for the unfiltered introduction of turbulent wind energy into the mound itself and what happens there is an incredible uh, collective defense if you will you get a mobilization of a mass of termites that comes up into the mound and they get busy patching that hole. They don't like it because it's introducing too much, you know, turbulence into their, into their quiet little world in the nest uh, uh, down, down below the ground. And they will, uh, first of all, patch it off, uh, seal it off, just like, you know, someone would come in with mortar to, to, uh, to patch a, uh, patch a, a hole in the concrete wall, for example. And over the period of uh, several months to actually a couple of years, they will come in and they will remodel this patch basically to introduce, reintroduce this very fine structure that helps damp out those turbulent wind fluctuations. Um, and um, Do you have a sense a of why they hate system. it so much? I mean, is it just um, the same as why I would hate to have a hole in my wall or something? It's just this unpredictable... 
elements probably, probably. Yeah. yes probably actually you know it's they they have a certain conception of comfort if you will that, that they that they they like to maintain and uh if that comfort is disturbed uh then they will get busy um changing the circumstances for that you know just in the same way that uh, if we were sitting next with our desk next to an open window for example and a turbulent gust of wind energy comes in and blows all our papers off that's not very comfortable for us and so what we what would we do? We would close the window. We would rearrange our papers. We would do whatever it takes to help avoid that uh, discomfort. And and it's the same kind of thing, obviously on a different level uh, for the termites themselves. They it's, it seems they to be almost like, like universal for biology, right? There seems to be this almost PID controller type situation where where we're always trying to move things back into. I mean, comfort is maybe like too squishy of a word, but it, it's something like that, right? If you take the most uh, Basic, even the the interest, the models that I've seen for neural networks seem to be aimed at trying to restore this resonance that's very predictable to the electrical circuits in the dish and so forth. It's very, very primitive and and universal. It seems to me. Yeah, and you've put your uh, thumb on the real problem here, which is it's it's not only I think that this kind of thing is not only a universal property of living systems, uh, uh, but um, uh, uh it's it's also um very complex doing that and 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 so the 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 seeking of comfort if you will that is of of uh, of of living comfortably or aptly within an environment this seems to be a universal phenomenon of life and it's manifested in various uh, ways of course different kinds of uh, complex networks and so forth and the structure and function of the complex networks is what physiology really is all about for living systems. But then you have this core of where is that primitive seeking of comfort coming from? You know, is that a universal property of life? Uh, what's generating what? Is it the uh, desire for comfort, if you will, that's generating the mechanisms or as uh, as uh, uh, a lot of my colleagues are are accustomed to explore. Is it the is it the um, uh, comfort that is the result of a mechanism, this complex mechanism going on? And and this is this kind of gets to the core of of uh, the the puzzle, if you will, that I was trying to work out with these with these termite colonies. Um, in the case of the termite colonies, of course, you have this swarm of tiny individuals, um, none of which are 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 very intelligent. Um, the temptation for a lot of people is to treat them as tiny little robots, where you can put in a function, little black boxes, and you get out a, a reliable response. And so. The tendency is to treat these swarms of, of of insects as basically tiny robots that can be programmed and whatnot. And there's a whole there's a whole uh, research area that's devoted to uh, that kind of uh, thing to be able to create robots, swarms of robots that can do things in swarms that they couldn't do on their own, um, and to deploy those in various ways. And so, uh, for example, one of the one of my colleagues uh, uh, had a proposal that, well, okay, suppose you want to uh, build a colony housing on mars how do you do it you know do you shoot up a house on a rocket and then land it and hope it doesn't get smashed or do you send up a whole bunch of robots that can themselves build the houses for the astronauts that uh, are, are eventually going to um, arrive and and so uh, you know this this kind of um, approach and i'm not taking anything away from it at all it's just incredibly fascinating work this kind of approach is 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 built upon the presumption that these termites are essentially robots that is machines that uh, that uh, you know are circuits and uh, levers and batteries and all this other kind of thing and uh, is that really a living thing then um, you know i would say probably not because the robots don't have a a, a, a uh, they don't have pursuit of comfort as uh, part of what's built in you can program in behaviors that make it look like it but in the end 
the termites don't really care about comfort one way or the, not, I beg your pardon, I said that wrong. The machines don't really care about comfort one way or the other. The termites do, you know, and one of the things that they uh, pursue in the pursuit of comfort is to avoid rapid fluctuations of concentrations of oxygen, humidity, uh, concentrations of carbon dioxide, and those kinds of things. And when you introduce turbulent wind energy into, into a system, what you get is these fluctuations. And the termites don't like that. It's very uncomfortable for them. And then they will get to work um, uh, opposing that. I mean, it's interesting how in order to answer the questions of why a biological organism does something, you almost have to go all the way back to the beginning and start asking the question of, well, what makes a biological organism? And it seems like that's where you're saying the Darwinist perspective doesn't totally hold because you can't pull out a desire for comfort out of a genetic landscape. That's right. In fact, uh, it, it undermines the entire uh, the entire foundation of the Darwinian point of view, which is that um, you have an organism. And by the way, uh, evolutionary biologists will be very honest about this. They will say that, well, we can't really say anything about the origin of life. Um, all we can talk about is the evolution of life, and you know, Darwinism is it basically. And um, of course, that kind of just kicks the can down the road, doesn't it? Because if you're going to talk about life as having a history, uh, you have to be able to ultimately get back to how it started. And of course, one of the popular um, uh, ways around that problem for modern evolutionary thought is to uh, basically go to Francis Crick's uh, um, uh, hypothesis that, well, you know, life exists on earth because it was seeded by rocks and whatever that have the elements of life in them in other words okay life originated somewhere just not here we were just colonized here but of course that doesn't really get to the get to the get to the problem um and the the there's a real dodge there because even the simplest kind of organism even the simplest kind of a cell is incredibly complex and this is one of the things that characterizes all of life after all you know we're incredibly complex uh, uh, entities uh, very complex processes and so forth and if you're going to assume that darwinian selection can actually lead to the evolution of complexity in organisms like ourselves or or other mammals or or or, or even uh, bacteria you can't really say that you have a coherent theory of evolution without understanding something about how um, how this uh, uh, helps move uh, chemistry into biology, to quote the words of uh, one of my Israeli colleagues, uh, uh, Adi Pross. And you know, you know, his his theory is well, how how did chemistry become biology? And and the Darwinian idea just doesn't really get to it and it doesn't get to it because um uh, you're talking about uh, uh alternate forms of memory for example you're talking about that aren't related to dna um or or to nucleic acids uh you're talking about actually what are very high odds against uh, all this stuff coming together even if you look at it uh, in, in terms of piecemeal evolution uh you're talking about actually um uh uh, a long time for this to happen uh you know uh, for example um at such small scales you have to deal constantly with a very destructive uh force that operates at small scales namely diffusion and to us diffusion seems benign but at these small scales it's an absolutely destructive force and so somehow you have to be able to get the evolution of at minimum an incredibly complex uh system in the face of this constant uh, destructive influence of of uh, diffusion, and at the bare minimum, you're talking about actually a very long time frame for emergence of life from a non-living system. And the evidence for uh, the emergence of life, as much as it can be constructed from you know fossil evidence, is that it actually 
arose quite quickly after life arose arose quite quickly after uh, the earth became cool enough to support liquid water and uh, and uh, and and uh, uh, those sorts of things. So, so for a number of reasons, the whole Darwinian idea doesn't really uh, present a convincing. Uh, f- face as a coherent theory of life, which uh, which many people uh, say it does, and it doesn't provide a very coherent framework for understanding really the most fundamental question, which is how did life originate? What is it that uh, that made it come to being? But I think it's significant that he called it the origin of species rather than the origin of life. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, Darwin, you know, he was quite frank about uh, about uh, this. He was dealing with the adaptation of an evolution of organisms, and uh, that's fair enough. Uh, that said, of course, he didn't shy away from speculation about the origin of life. You know, his famous warm little pond uh, scenario, which 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 was only in a uh, a letter to Joseph Hooker, his colleague, uh, I believe. Uh, but but he was still speculating about this, you know, and. Uh, and and uh, uh, he basically fell into the same uh, mindset that um, that that most people still do. That is, given enough time, you'll eventually get life coming from these kinds of physical processes. His metaphor for that was the warm little pond uh, idea. And uh, there's just not enough time for life to emerge. And that I guess of, you could mash kind of mash that hypothesis together with Crick's idea. You know, maybe there was enough time somewhere else, and then Earth was seeded with something that was more developed. Could be, could be certainly, but uh, um, you still have the problem. You know, how do you get the origin of life, which is, uh, and in one context, a very very complex interrelated set of chemical processes, chemical and physical processes, how do you get all those things uh, coming together in just the right way uh, so that you have a living system there? And and to me, that just, that's, that strikes me as kind of a dodge, you know, it's, it's saying, well, maybe it could be, so we're not going to worry about this problem. Uh, we're going to say that, well, maybe somewhere there's, there's been enough time for all this stuff to uh, come together randomly. And, um, you know, I, 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 I don't know of anyone, whether it's the, uh, it's the, um, it's it's people coming from a, a, a purely scientific or chemical materialist uh, point of view, uh, all the way to you know let's just say it frankly the intelligent design people. If you look at the probabilities of this happening, they are infinitesimally small, and and uh, and and so you know I think everyone can agree that the probability of, of all the complex pieces of a living system even the simplest living system uh, coming together gradually over time you know the the metaphor of the 10 million monkeys typing at the at the uh, typewriters who will eventually produce the sonnets of Shakespeare it's 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 just improbable infinitesimally improbable and um uh, you know it's it's as I said, I, it strikes me as a dodge to the real problem, which is how do you build a coherent theory of evolution and life that's going to help explain the full range of, of, uh, of living phenomena, which includes its origins and its evolution. So, yeah. Oh, hold on. Yeah, go ahead. I think that there's something really interesting here, which you and I have talked about before, Shiloh, which is that are we correct to conflate the origin of life with the origin of cells? Um, I would say no. Um, and the because um, people do that very, very casually, right? Like we, when we talk oh, about yeah. the emergence of complexity, and when people talk, you know, it's so crazy that we have these cells. How do you get? How do you get such co- such life? And I'm like, well, that's very complex. Like even a virus is a very complex structure. And yeah. there's a lot of question about whether or not that's the minimum unit of, of life. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely right. You know, even the simplest cell is uh, that we have uh, presently is so, it depends upon such an incredibly uh, interdependent uh, set of complex systems 
that it is difficult to imagine it emerging spontaneously and and uh and that therefore uh you know there had to be something else that that uh not only helps us gain insight into the not only the origin of life but also uh, its present structure in the form of cells you know and as i said these cells are very very complicated systems even the simplest that you can come up with and there have been various uh ingenious uh ideas about how you can get there um uh, there's one theory for example that said well no the first living things weren't uh carbon based they were silicon based uh, uh this is uh, karen smith's idea that you basically have clay crystals that can act as catalysts that are sort of uh, uh prior to the emergence of our our present day protein catalysts and that you had memory in the form of self-propagating crystal structures, for example, that could uh, serve as an interim form of uh, hereditary memory, and that through time, uh, those sorts of uh, various stages of complexity built upon uh, previous ones to the point where you had uh, uh, hybrid clay silicon uh, carbon-based uh, systems that did the metabolism of living thing and eventually the carbon-based part became complex enough to stand off on its own and basically uh, kicked out the uh, scaffolding of, of a silicon that had that had preceded that that to me is probably one of the most interesting and credible theories for how life can emerge uh, from uh, from very simple uh, systems, and of course, every time you you uh, well, the 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 thing that uh, strikes me as it being quite credible is it has a form of hereditary memory. It has a form of adaptation. It all depends upon there being this ratchet of 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 complexity, and that's a very interesting idea. It's credible, but does it really explain it? Is there such a thing really? You know, is there is there um, uh, uh, when you say is there such a thing is it is is there such a thing as complexity or is there such a thing as the ratchet is there such a thing as a ratchet of complexity where if you attain a certain level of complexity you can't go back you know and so that's what this uh the, this this uh, uh hybrid silicon carbon uh theory for the origin of life depends upon every step increase of complexity is going to uh, be permanent enough for the next complex step more complex step to build upon uh the previous one and and like i said it's a fascinating idea it's one of the more original ideas that helps get helps get around uh some of the issues of uh trying to imagine life emerging first as a carbon-based uh, system with its complex form of memory and nucleic acids its complex form of function in the form of proteins and uh and and uh, uh, whatnot, but it does depend upon these assumptions that uh, that there is a ratchet of complexity and that you cannot go back, and that it will be strong enough to be able to withstand the kinds of, uh, as I said, I keep coming back to this, this very destructive force of diffusion that operates uh, very powerfully at small scales like this. And and so, um, you know, maybe it could work. You know, we can't really test it, uh, obviously, but it's a it's a different way of thinking about it. And so, um, I'm going to have a coughing jag here. Excuse me. You know, there's this other element too that doesn't get a lot of play from Charles's book, which is. You know, you, you always hear about the selection. I like that you're on a first name basis with Darwin. You know, I feel like he comes <laughs> up enough that uh, that we can we can be pals like that. Uh, but he he mentions, I think, dozens of times in his book the struggle to exist as being a quality of life as well. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there's some way of tuning into that process in basic chemical systems that would reveal so, some elements of of proto life. Mm -hmm. as defined as this struggle to persist and to exist. Because a philosophical definition for life is desire and will. It's, it's this time machine quality of life that 
aims at something in the future that isn't here yet. And humans are the epitome of the time machine version of life. But it seems like, like this that's goal oriented, this retuning, this comfort driven, adapt your like also adapt your environment to your comfort. That's that there's an interesting element to that. And I wonder if there's basic chemical processes that hint at this. There are, uh, you, you know, and and uh, uh, you can uh, demonstrate actually in the test tube or in the laboratory situation that that you can have these kinds of persistent um, uh, lifelike uh, chemical systems. And I can't remember the name of it right at the moment. It's not at the tips of my 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 tongue. But you have this. Um, reaction where you combine two things and as the reaction proceeds it forms these beautiful spiral structures within the within the uh within the experimental arena uh there are also some interesting things that go on in purely chemical systems where you have uh certain um uh, sets of of chemical reactants that that produce complexity, right? And uh, and uh, our body is is full of those. Of course, you know we we uh, we are obviously at the molecular level very complex beings, and those complex uh, structures have to be built somehow. Um, but I guess what you would really want to see is those spirals doing something to their environment that allows them to persist. Something. Yes, some, some sort of feedback between the environment where they're remodeling the environment in order to exactly. provide exactly. for their continued existence, something like that. Yeah, exactly, and 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 uh, uh, that's that's one area where where uh, uh, this kind of complexity builds upon complexity. Yes, that's absolutely right, and there's been a lot of ingenious chemical work uh, been done to try to um, uh, formulate how this kind of thing can can happen um one of them is of course is the famous rna world where where the uh the um uh, the original repository of hereditary memory was not in dna but in rna and and of course one of the things uh, that makes rna world kind of an interesting and uh, attractive idea is that uh, of course uh, rna can serve as both a catalyst and as a self-replicating uh, memory um, um and again i give uh, full credit to that but where's the where's the persistence in that and and what you have mentioned uh, is uh, the really important uh, missing element from most theories of the chemical origin of life namely how is it that you get these kinds of chemical systems that are persistent enough to be able to uh, last long enough to overcome the destructive power of diffusion at that scale and uh, this is um, this is basically a a problem in thermodynamics you know if you if you look at uh, most of these chemical systems that are built in the laboratory for example as well as in our own example of life um, we are very highly ordered uh uh, chemical systems at a at a minimum, very very highly ordered, and and of course uh, the way that a a uh, physicist would describe this is that we are very low entropy systems. Uh, entropy being, of course, uh, the state of disorder. And if you look at uh, chemical systems as a purely thermodynamic system, they always tend towards maximum entropy um you you can you can generate orderliness at a at a uh, at a certain scale whatever scale you're working at but it's like those termite mounds you know there's always a relentless force if you will that's driving those systems towards maximum entropy and when uh as and and as part of that you uh you you basically are taking this highly ordered system and you're allowing it to degrade to uh, high entropy and releasing energy heat basically in the process. And of course, the other side of that is that in order to get to this highly ordered state, you have to do work on matter and energy, a flow of matter and energy through this system. And and uh, so, for example, you know, we are a highly ordered system. Any organism is a highly ordered system. And 
The only way it persists through time in some kind of recognizable form is by continually doing work to take take disordered matter and organize it into the ordered system that we are, basically not stopping entropy, the degradation to entropy, but basically working against it continually so that we have a constant level of high order. High order means a constant level of high function, and it takes energy, metabolic energy, to be able to pull that off. Well, we're actually we're actually tearing up the environment, right? We're actually disordering the heck out of everything. Like, if you take the organism in isolation, it seems like, on balance, the entropy is decreasing. But if you examine the environment, like, I'm just tearing up air molecules right now all day long. Yeah. You know, yeah. where if you look at the system as a whole, there's a flow of entropy, which is in the proper order, as we should expect in a physical system. But you yeah, can't just yeah. look at the organism by itself. And in fact, it seems there's this guy, Rod Swenson, who's essentially proposed that you can define life thermodynamically as that which maximizes entropy in a given mm -hmm. system, which is, is quite a different take on the matter. And which is also something that makes the crystal hypothesis about the origin of life really interesting to me because crystals can form spontaneously. I did a lot of protein biochemistry mm -hmm. when I was coming up and so a lot of protein crystallization experiments and so I know that you can add things together in a specific format and you can get yeah. a crystal of some kind of protein and it feels like this idea of maximizing entropy is that life is a crystal structure of great complexity mm -hmm over which you flow substances to be torn apart in order to maintain the crystalline structure that is necessary to then perpetuate itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's uh, uh, you know, very reminiscent of uh, Schrodinger's definition of, mm. of what life is. You know, he had the same kind of, he had the same kind of, um, uh, idea that 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 life and basically heredity, if you will, acts like an what he called an aperiodic crystal, and 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 so you're absolutely right. You know the, this 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 kind of uh, uh, well, as you said, a, a crystal is really a highly ordered structure, and uh, it takes work to be able to produce those. Now, if you look at some of these. Uh, uh, reactions in uh, in petri dishes, basically trying to demonstrate uh, these complex spirals. For example, you know that's going from basically a high energy system to a low energy system, and the transition from from high order to low order uh, basically proceeds in a way that actually maximizes the 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 production of entropy. What you were uh, uh, just saying, uh, and and one of the curious things that comes out of that is that you get a kind of a spontaneous orderliness that comes out of this. You know, if you if you look at uh, um, that kind of reaction, for example, those spirals are a consequence of a rapid degradation of that complex system to disorder, maximizing the rate of entropy production, as you said. If you look at other orderly kinds of uh, kinds of um, uh, systems uh, at many scales, and so, for example, some of the some of the uh, large scale uh, patterns of oceanic and atmospheric circulation, for example, those are also highly ordered uh, systems. And uh, when you have a hurricane forming, for example, in the South Atlantic, that very highly ordered structure is a consequence of of increasing heat coming in from the sun, uh, warming water and atmosphere and all those sorts of things. And the rate at which you can get uh, from high energy down to uh, high entropy basically imposes this kind of transient orderliness on the system and and this goes by various names as uh, i think Stuart kaufman it is who uh, he describes this as the fourth law of thermodynamics not you know the one two three but there's an act there's an actual additional one and 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 this is most prominent in uh, what are called open thermodynamic systems in which <clears throat> you not only where you don't just have a closed system with high entropy and low entropy and whatnot, and this degrades ultimately to a state of maximum uh, entropy, but you have a continual flow of energy uh, uh, through there, kind of like what you were uh, describing just now, um, um, Anastasia. <clears throat> and 
And so when you talk about that, yes, absolutely, that's a well-established uh, thermodynamic uh, term. But then, you, you know, when you get into this idea that life is a fundamentally disordering process on the environment, um, uh, that's that doesn't really ring true to me, you know. And and uh, um, I, you know, when when I started thinking about this with the termite mound, um, that's a highly ordered structure, and the termites are creating order in their environment. In other words, they're adapting the environment to themselves. They're creating an entirely new environment. And, uh, you know, that's, that's life producing order to my mind. And, and so a, um, I think a credible alternative hypothesis to the notion that life is a fundamentally disordering phenomenon. Um, the alternative is that, well, actually, no, that may not be correct. It may be that life is actually a fundamentally ordering phenomenon on, on the environment. Uh, it structures the environment in such a way that it perpetuates the uh, activities of living things to persist to uh, carry on through time and this is where we come into uh, James Lovelock's Gaia theory obviously you know and and uh, uh, if you look at the earth for example I mean Lovelock basically said that you can detect life on whether a, a planet is alive or not by looking at the amount of uh, uh, the, by the persistence of orderliness uh, in whatever you can detect and of course his idea was that well you look at the atmosphere you want to know whether Mars is alive or not you look at whether the Martian atmosphere atmosphere is at equilibrium or at some kind of disequilibrium and you know he concluded obviously that uh, if life is there it's not uh, uh, substantial enough to actually push the martian atmosphere away from its chemical equilibrium state but if you look at the earth which is obviously alive we all know what's alive then it's a very highly ordered uh, chemical um uh, system you know the fact that we have oxygen in the atmosphere is a product of life basically organizing uh, the atmosphere and basically everything else in on earth uh, towards this highly ordered uh, disequilibrium uh, system and so the only way you can salvage the the uh, third law of thermodynamics in that case is that well okay, okay if life is actually disordering the environment then the boundary at which uh, which the disorder the disorder starts to uh, come into being is not the boundary of the organism. It's actually the boundary of the biosphere. And so somehow, you know, perhaps the living Earth is disordering energy in the environment, but the boundary at which that takes place is actually the biosphere itself. And uh, otherwise, if you look at all the components uh, within that system, uh, they're creating order like crazy and they're creating order by modifying environments to suit the uh the physiology of the living systems in it one thing that kind of troubles me about these superorganism theories uh, i i really want to believe them but it seems to me that something is necessary to be an organism which is that you exist among a community of organisms and so if we think about the termite systems as a superorganism or even worse the earth as a superorganism who are the other organisms in that niche and there must be interactions between those organisms right and do you see those in the termite mounds are these mounds somehow interacting with one another or like yeah i'm not even going to crack is it open the speculation for you but... to have them interact with their environment and or with the other creatures that are there or do they have to be directly well, if like it's one superorganism with another superorganism? Exactly, yeah. If the superorganism is a thing by itself, then I would expect that it's interacting. Because all organisms interact with other organisms of their same kind. So like kind. warring termite mounds would satisfy you? Warring or maybe maybe collaborating? Okay. I wouldn't say that all organisms just war with each other. Sorry, that's yeah. just my... <laughs> <laughs> just humans. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's... it's uh, this, of course, is getting into what we mean by when we say the word organism, and and uh, it seems obvious to us because consciously we're aware of ourselves as as uh, um, 
uh, autonomous entities, if you will. We have a consciousness that we are we are something, and uh, and we look around ourselves and we see other kinds of discrete uh, units. You know, my dog, uh, the deer that are wandering through the woods, the trees, and so forth, as these kinds of discrete uh, entities that we can hang this label uh, of organism on. But if you look at the organization of of life, you know, let's 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 go from the skin in. You know, we also are super organisms. You know, we're a collection of of uh, of of sel- several billion uh, entities that can themselves be described as organisms. I I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't uh, for a moment try to deny uh, the status of organism to a cell because they're autonomous. They they, uh, they 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 manage their own uh, internal organization. They interact with other uh, cells out there, and so clearly, cells are organisms. Does that make us a super organism of all these cells and so forth? And 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 so you have this kind of sliding scale of of, of what is an organism that makes it very difficult to pin down what is what we mean when we say the term organism. And of course, when we get into uh, social insect colonies. You're absolutely right. You know, it's a difficult concept. Is this is the uh, bee colony or is a termite colony an organism, or is it a super organism, or is it something else? And and uh, you know, we've we've everyone's grappled with this with this with this problem. But um, you know, we, we can if we if we think of uh, well, okay. Organisms can exist at many different scales, ranging from the cell, maybe even some subcellular structures, up to the biosphere itself. I mean, I I have some sympathy with you know Lovelock's original uh, idea that the Earth is an organism. You know, and of course, when you do that, then you get into the kinds of interactions between uh, different levels of organization and different scales that you mentioned, um, and so. You know, we have a problem with language, I think, that is masking what's really going on, which is that life exists at numbers of different scales. Uh, cells within our own bodies interact with one another. Uh, they compete with one another. Uh, they don't always cooperate with one another. Um, again, when we come up to the level of uh, our organisms and interactions with our cells, with other human organisms or other kinds of organisms, then there's obviously a kind of um, uh, exchange of information, material, energy, all those kinds of things. And uh, if if you have a kind of a persistent system there, a persistent interaction, then to me that qualifies as an organism of some sort. Maybe we don't have the right words for it, but you know, you 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 again put your put your thumb on on the uh, on on the button, which is that what is operating at all those scales is this flow of matter and energy between different kinds of uh, foci if you will of uh, of of order production and uh, the interactions between them can uh, can shape the way that the whole system uh, persists through time or doesn't persist through time uh, uh, those sorts of things and if you look into you know ecosystems for example uh, the tree outside my window it's not a tree really it's a combination of of not only the tree cells, if you will, but it's also uh, the fungi and the roots that it interacts with, how those fungi interact with one another, uh, how insects that come along and uh, try to munch on the leaves, how those interact with one another. And so you get this uh, this this kind of immense and complex flow of matter and energy between all these different units that comprise what we see as an organism. And if they persist, I would say that that's, if they persist and if they adapt, if they persist in the face of changing environmental circumstances, that's one of the characteristics of organisms uh, broadly defined. And so I, I it just seems to me like there's this, you just can't ignore the importance of community and organisms, right? Like, I, I definitely buy that Absolutely. the cells are organisms because they're com- inside of my yeah. body because they're all working with yeah. one another and so forth. Um, yeah. But, like, yeah. what's the, it's kind of like, what's the worst torture you can impose upon a human being, even in prison? It's like you put them in a box by themselves. And it's yeah. like the yeah. worst imaginable thing for a human being. Yeah. Because we yeah. really need each other in order to be, orga- like, fully functioning organisms. 
And so I just Absolutely. wonder what sort of interactions we might expect if the hypothesis that, say, the termite mound is a superorganism, if it is an organism on some different scale, what sort of interactions might we, might we imagine between the different organisms, the different termite mm -hmm. mounds on a landscape? Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. In the case of the termite mounds, uh, well, in case of all these things, we're really talking about uh, maintaining flows of matter and energy through this order producing kind of a system. But if you get down into the nuts and bolts of what's going on with uh, termite mounds, for example, um, they, uh, one of their uh, most striking characteristics is that they cultivate a symbiotic fungus. So, uh, you know, I would say more of the biomass of the nest itself is is uh, is is composed of these fungi and the fungi are actually cultivated by the termites um some details about how that works the termites go out and uh, from the colony and and they can spread out a, over a range of about 70 meters or so from the from the uh, from the lo locus of the colony uh, those termites go out they bring back a uh, 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 dried chew up grass dried grass uh, uh bark dead wood those kinds of things they they generally don't like living tissue uh so they take all this uh all this carbohydrate that's just sort of sitting around dry they bring it back to the nest and they turn it over to other termites that take the um ingested uh raw wood if you will and turn it into these incredibly beautiful structures that are called fungus combs and they inoculate these fungus combs with this uh, symbiotic fungus and and what the uh, what these fungus combs do is they actually act as a kind of a kind of a colon an extra corporeal digestive tract basically for the colony so these fungi they take the raw forage and they break it down into simpler sugars and liberate nitrogen and protein and whatnot and then the term Termites uh, basically eat this composted uh, composted wood material, and so they interact with the fungi in such a way as to basically enrich the uh, diet for the termites. And this is, of course, one of the reasons why they can support such large numbers of uh, workers within within the colony. And so that's one type of interaction. There's another type of interaction, though, and. That is that uh, in order to be useful to the termites, the fungi have to not only be slow growing, but they also have to absorb the products of the, their digestion slowly. And what that does for the termites is it, it, it's, it's, it helps enrich this uh, digested uh, wood. There are lots of other, other fungi in there that would like to get their hands Figure, uh, figuratively on this uh, forage. And this includes a number of fast-growing fungi, uh, fungi that absorb the nutrient, the digested nutrients quickly. And when that happens, they're not available to the termites anymore. And so, and so uh, what the termites need is they need to be able to cultivate this one species of fungus, which is slow-growing, which in the natural world does not compete well with all the other fungi that like to eat wood out there. And the key to uh, making sure that these fast-growing fungi don't take over that fungus comb is to regulate the humidity of the nest itself. Uh, uh, they are very careful to regulate the nest moisture, and they keep it at about 80% relative humidity or so. All right, so that's another kind of interaction. But the third kind of interaction is interaction with the environment. And in this, uh, in in these arid savannas, you have a very strong annual cycle of rainfall. Uh, during the winter, for example, very severe drought. Uh, you're talking about relative humidities commonly in the single digits. And in the face of that, these termites have to be able to maintain their nest at 80% relative humidity. And to do that, they need to be able to get water. And uh, and the way that these termites do it is that they will go quite deep to mine water, to bring it up into the nest, to keep that nest at a high relative humidity with respect to the very low humidities in the surrounding soil and in the air. 
when the summers come along, you have these torrential rainfalls. And, uh, and of course, what that's going to do is it's going to percolate a lot more water down into the nest. And what the termites do in that case is that they start actually transporting water out of the nest in the form of wet soil, and they transport it to the only place they can to get rid of it, which is in the building mound. And so that's one of the motivating factors for, for actually building the mound. Uh, there's some additional things as well there. So when you look at the interaction between, you know, between the totality of these different, uh, these, the, these different entities, you have the termites, you have the fungi, you have the regulation of humidity, and you have the uh, modification of water transport uh, that keeps this at a particular state the nest at a particular state, 80% relative humidity in the face of wide annual fluctuations in environmental moisture. And, and so, uh, I mean, what know, I'm so, hearing like lots of, I'm hearing these uh, interactions with the environment and remodeling of the environment, which I mean, definitely convinces me that they're alive. But mm -hmm. when I look, I've seen some of these pictures and there's multiple mounds out on these prairies, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What, is there any sense of, of some sort of community amongst those mounds? I think that there's huge intermountain communities. Like I remember reading about the fact that there was this like enormous termite colony that had thousands and thousands of mounds. Mm -hmm. mm. So they have multiple mounds per colony or per per yeah. uh, group. Yeah, yeah, and and that's nice. absolutely right. You know, some of the, especially some of the North American termite colonies. You know, which are, I don't know if this is a fair term or not, but but uh, they're actually more primitive termites and the neutral. Uh, meaning of that is that they preceded uh, uh, other termites uh, uh, in in time. Uh, some of these uh, termite colonies are uh, they they exist functionally as organisms, and they can they can uh, occupy you know multiple square miles of territory. So absolutely, that's that's correct. Uh, when you look at the uh, macro termite. Uh, the, the macro termites, for example, the ones that build those large mounds, uh, if you see a field where uh, there are multiple um, uh, uh, colonies, uh, what those are is a group of colonies dividing the environments into foraging territories basically so as i said from the central point of the of the nest itself termites will foraging termites will radiate out to a, a, a distance of about 70 meters from the central locus of the mound and and uh, if you look at the spacing between these uh, different uh, termite colonies in a field for example uh, that's consistent with basically each colony you know, having they sort of negotiate this, with these boundaries. They're kind of negotiating, and and uh, of course, this is one of the other uh, interesting things uh, about this. One of the assumptions that has come from all this is that, well, if you have two different uh, termite colonies at this interface, they're going to be competing with one another. You know, they're going to be fighting. They're going to be walling off the territories between one another. And we did some experiments once where we took termites from one colony, we put them into an arena next to termites from an adjacent colony, and we were expecting to see some interesting fights between them. Didn't see it. You know, they were perfectly uh, uh, compatible with one another. It was There was no difference in their behaviors uh, uh, of these uh, mixed uh, colony termites compared mm. to, col you know, individuals from individual colonies. And, uh, you know, they're we, diplomats. We, well, they're negotiating exactly, and and uh, uh, we pondered that for a while. And what we finally came up with was that, well, you know, if if you look at the reproduction of a termite colony, for example, this is an annual event. You have a special class of reproductive individuals that come from the nest. They fly around for a little bit. They land, and uh, and they. Uh, uh, and the, the females break off their wings, they mate, they build a colony, uh, an incipient colony. And if you look at the dispersal distance, it's very small. So if you see these kinds of fields where you have lots of termite uh, colonies, they're very likely very closely related to one another, you know, because uh, uh, not only are the colonies themselves uh, somewhat inbred, uh, uh, but um, also, you know, the dispersal distance is so small that 
an adjacent colony is likely to be a direct descendant of, of, of the original colony. So I have a feeling that you're right. There's a lot of cooperation that's going to go on between these adjacent colonies. Uh, and where competition really does come in is, is if you have a colony that dies, for example, that leaves an unoccupied territory. And what that does is it opens up a space for competing uh, termites to come in. And the competing termite that typically comes in is another species called hodotermes. And these are kind of like the weeds of the termite world. They come in, they colonize, they grow rapidly, they reproduce, and then they basically bugger off. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and so what these large um, assemblages of related macrotermes do, does the mound building termites is they basically are are occupying a territory sufficiently um, uh, intensively so that these competing weedy termites can't come in and establish a presence and uh, um, you know there, there's there's there, there's kind of a funny story about that uh, uh, when I was first working in Namibia uh, farmers uh, came to me a lot and said can you help kill our termites uh, termite colonies uh, because uh, they're eating grass they're competing with our cattle and and, and whatnot and uh, I had to tell them look you know the only reason you have a savanna is because of these termites you know they Turn over soil; they make it fertile. Uh, they're the reasons that trees exist and and grasses exist in these uh, uh, savannas. And the last thing in the world you want to do is kill kill those uh, kill those termites. And it's because they are basically uh, entrenched there. They are a very constructive process. They're turning over soil in the same way that uh, earthworms do in more uh, in more um, uh, mesic environments. And uh, and they're basically the reasons these ecosystems exist. Let's take a break right now. Consider coming to Austin in April of 2024 for our very first scientific conference. It is going to be called Demysticon. It is timed to coincide with the April 8th solar eclipse. It's going to be two days of talks from our favorite guests. Right now we have Ogi Ogus, we have Steve Keen, we have Pierre-Marie Robitaille, we have David Ian Howe, and we have John F. White, who runs the Craig and Ford YouTube channel, who are all going to come and give talks about the subjects that they're most interested in. Tickets are available in the link in the description. So come over to our Patreon, help promote the podcast, and make sure that you get tickets to our event. Before we move on from the Gaian stuff, I thought I might pick out that a little bit more because I, I'm also I have this deep seated want to believe in this Gaian idea of the superorganism. Mm -hmm. But it it brings up more questions. Like assuming that it is the case, and there are, are other organisms in the universe, and maybe we're in solitary confinement and but maybe other Earths are interacting with each other, and so it is a reasonable hypothesis. What is the organelle-like role of our own species in that superorganism? What what's our function? The organelle-like role. I'm intrigued by yeah. that. Well, like, yeah, uh, like every, like each or like in a superorganism, or let's just say in a regular organism like myself, I have say blood cells, I have immune cells. They each have a job to do in order to mm -hmm. Uh, as Charles put it, to struggle for my existence. They all participate in that. What is the human being's role in the super Gaian organism? Uh, on Earth? I, I, you, yeah. you, you mentioned other worlds there, but just on Earth? Just Let's just say just on Earth, yeah. Okay. Or maybe it is, maybe we are sort of like the, maybe our, our role is to connect us to other worlds. I don't know. I'm, I'm just always... Curious if you've thought about that, what what the role of the human being is? Yeah, um, it, it's um, there's what we do, uh, which is really what every other organism in quotes does, which is uh, persists and uh, uh, um, works, strives, I would say, to to not only maintain a flow of energy, the the flow of matter and energy that's necessary for the persistence to uh, occur, but also to increase it. So there is a certain degree of competition uh, going on there. <clears throat> um, uh, what role that has, um, uh, that's a difficult one because uh, 
uh, who or what defines that role. And uh, uh, clearly, we're very versatile at at uh, one form of uh, maintaining our persistence, which is to uh, maintain a particular flow of energy through ourselves in order for ourselves to persist. Uh, energy is needed. That's just the thermodynamics of it. Uh, it takes energy to produce order. And of course, when you look at uh, uh, the ways in which we uh, are tapping into various sources of energy, it goes all the way from uh, fire to uh, fossil fuels, uh, coal and uh, oil, and all the things that follow from that uh, up to nuclear energy and, uh, you know, tapping into the forces that are holding atoms together. And um, so that's one thing that we do. We're also very, very clever at uh, figuring out ways to uh, increase and manage the flow of matter to ourselves as well. And of course, this uh, this goes from being hunter-gatherers to agriculture to uh, building of uh, civilizations and massive cities and all the infrastructure that goes along with that. And and again, that's part of this uh, um, uh, adapting the environment to ourselves to our own comfort and so that's very what does that do for the, part the super organism i mean i you know my answer to this no i know i want to i want to i want to get his take on it <laughs> I, I, what, well, what is uh, what is the what do we do for that organism um when you're talking about other organisms, there's 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 billions of other species and organisms on the planet, and uh, and uh, everyone is engaged in a conversation with every other. And uh, of course, the metaphor you can uh, you can maybe um, uh, use is the cobweb. You know, you have this incredibly uh, interlinked mixture of threads, each thread being, of course, the channel of flow of matter energy or information between them and you can't tug on one without tugging on others and and so it's very it's very difficult to pin down uh you know that 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 we're having an effect on the environment what we're doing is we're tugging a lot of uh, uh different flows of matter and energy and altering them and one of the things that happens there is that we're modifying ecosystems you know and and uh, everything that goes into this and uh probably the one that resonates most uh strongly with most people if you look at uh if you look at the avifauna, the bird populations in cities versus the uh, versus uh, elsewhere, you know, house sparrows are the big deal in cities. You know, house sparrows and pigeons, they're quite dominant there. That's their niche, if you will. You know, uh, this is a, a part of the niche that we've constructed, whereas if you go out into the countryside, you have uh, different species, actually a richer species of, of bird. And and uh, we can manipulate, uh, well, our presence manipulates that as well. If you turn a woodland into agricultural uh, field, then that's going to be uh, influencing the uh, kinds of uh, birds that can live there. Never mind all the different kinds of microorganisms that live in the soil, the fungi, uh, the organisms that burrow through soil. You know, earthworms are the most obvious example. Uh, um, and, and, and so... The, you know what our role is really is if you will is to persist that's what's driving our um our own ecology and our own extended organism so to speak um and every time we do that like i said we're tugging on all these different threads and there's going to be uh consequences of that uh, i'm not so sure it's going to be always negative consequences i'm not sure it's it's feasible to say that Whatever we do, we're degrading the environment. What we're doing is we're subtly changing the environment, and there'll be uh, consequences uh, uh, that will follow from that. But whether they're um, well, such whether a it's bad or not is hard that. to say. No, I, I appreciate that. It's such a measured perspective. Uh -huh. I feel like oftentimes there's this terribly anti-human perspective that everything that yeah. humans do is wrong and bad and unnatural, a, a, a plague upon the earth to be eradicated. And I uh -huh. think that it's really worthwhile to stop and consider that there is... Almost by definition, we have to be serving the persistence of the superorganism or it wouldn't have produced us or tolerate us. So this is where we come into something that's really interesting, which is that purpose and desire 
are basically forbidden words in biology. You can't have those when you're talking about anything scientific. And so when we, I think that this is why the Gaia hypothesis really freaks people out, because there must be a teleology to the organisms inside of Gaia for it to hold. And then you have to start talking about, like you say, well, okay, you can look at a white blood cell and you can say that the white blood cell, it has a job to do in the body and it fits into these things. And so you... I don't know why people are so resistant to the idea that we have a job to do. Okay, so I have I have thoughts. I think that it might be because of religious sensibility to some degree, like that humans are born with this original sin and that there's this black mark upon our souls. And so what we must do is we must spend our lives atoning for the black mark of having been born not as animals. Uh, there's a lot in there to unpack, obviously. You know, the, the, <laughs> you're, 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 uh, you're, you're obviously correct that uh, when you talk about um, vitalist ideas. I call this the V word. You know, uh, biologists uh, uh, they fancy themselves that to be scientists you have to you have to abjure any kind of vitalist thinking, and it's really um, it's really it's not so much it's not really an enlightened way of thinking about life because it forces biologists to ignore what. What I think is is the distinctive attribute of living things, which is that they are purposeful, they are intentional, uh, they're intelligent in their own ways, um, and by uh, sort of shoving that off to the side, uh, uh, when you talk about design of organisms, for example, um, the trope is that well, it's not really design; it's apparent design. You know, it's only an illusion of design, or it's only an illusion of intentionality, and and that really narrows the perspective on how you think about life. You know, if you if you take this to its ultimate uh, ultimate logical conclusion, you know, if you conclude that a life is 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 can be fully explained as simple simply uh, material and physical systems, then you don't have a science of life anymore. You know, we should uh, change the names on all those biology department uh, signs to basically turn them into departments of physics and uh, chemistry. You know, there's you're ignoring the um, the to, to to me what what what's the fundamentally distinctive uh, nature of life, and I think biology has a real problem there because. Um, you know, how can you have a coherent science of life if you don't somehow account for its most fundamental attribute? And one of the things that has actually fueled, I think, the rise of modern Darwinism and and uh, um, prompted uh, uh, people to look at it as a coherent theory, when in fact it's actually quite empty is this desire to sort of abolish the notion of purpose from our study mm. of life and and uh, uh, you see this in uh, uh, not only the um, the the predominance of modern Darwinism that is gene selectionism in our way of thinking about evolution um, uh, this basically abolishes the the science of adaptation from from our conception of evolution you see it in in uh, swarm robotics for example you see it in our approach to uh, medicine as basically the body is a machine and therefore if we can tweak the the screws and springs and so forth you know we can somehow we can somehow heal people and so i think the the, the, the and there's the, also the most... a corollary to that right which is that if we are machines then we can build machines that are us yes that's right yeah that's right exactly and uh and i know a lot of people think that uh but uh i think it's basically wrong-headed you know it's uh uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not really worried about the rise of artificial intelligence, for example, or, or that we're going to have the singularity in which we, uh, in which we are, are, are oppressed under the uh, rule of machines, and in, in part, it's because machines cannot have desire or they cannot have wants, whereas those things are the things that make us. In fact, all living things uh, that make us what we are, and 
the little joke I use is that, uh, you know, you remember in Jeopardy, I don't know if you watch Jeopardy, but there was this famous match between Ken Jennings and Watson, the IBM computer. And of course, Watson won, you know, he was, uh, he was, uh, you know, smarter, if you will, than Ken Jennings was. But, you know, the big difference is that Ken Jennings wanted to win, you know. Watson didn't want to win. He was programmed to win. And uh, it was programmed to win, I should say. And, uh, <laughs> they and, named and, them and, specifically to make that harder to uh, Yeah, to say that's it. right. That's right. I don't know yeah, if you've so, seen, there's these really fantastic recursive loops that people set up where they have two AIs talk to each other. And it basically devolves into noise very, very yeah. quickly. And so mm -hmm. if you take one of those image generating AIs, and you link mm -hmm. it to a text AI, and you pass images and prompts back and forth to each other, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. one of them creates the image, and then you feed the image into the other one. You're like, can you describe this for me? And then mm -hmm. it describes it, and you take that text, and you put it back into the image-generating one. You go mm -hmm. from a painting of the Mona Lisa to just white noise in 50 uh, images. Uh. Okay. I had not seen that particular one. I've seen other examples where um, someone poses a question to chat GPT and uh, it's a completely fictional scenario and uh, chat G GPT just makes up stuff, you know, and like uh, the existence of mountains, uh, even with names and histories when such a thing doesn't actually exist in the real world. So, so you know, it, it's this kind of... Uh, Machine mentality, I think, uh, that is is dominating modern biology. Uh, it's dominating our popular thinking about modern biology, but it's missing what I think is the essential part, which is that uh, you know life is intentional, it's purposeful and intelligent, and we don't have a good science for that right now. I, th I think there's. I have a kind of half baked idea. Maybe you can help me work out, which is that okay. I think there's an element of state crafting in the defanging of the. the the V word values from scientific analysis. I think there's okay. some elements where the state likes to have these kind of like brains in vat, brilliant scientists working on these technical issues, but they don't really want them involved in the application of that knowledge in terms of thinking about the purposeful motion that's going forth. And, and I wonder if there's something to that, if you've thought about that at all in terms of why why is it that that biologists it's quite evident that this purposeful intentional autonomous motion is important to biology and and what sort of like cultural sociological political motive uh, forces for lack of a better word have driven our sciences into that that strange vacuum where that's just completely off the table yeah it's that's a that's just a fascinating and such a deep question you know the the um Science has, uh, I think, in the modern world, has has undergone a, um, a radical transformation in its culture, and I'm not sure that scientists are even, for the most part, aware of it. You know, if you, the dividing line for me is uh, around World War II, and uh, of course, uh, prior to World War II, there was very little government involvement in science, in academic science, I should say. And uh, in fact, uh, academic scientists, uh, for the most part, not all, for the most part, uh, work to keep state power uh, at as far a remove as they possibly could. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, government comes along with lots of money, and uh, that means opportunities and careers. And the first uh, step of that, of course, was the mobilization of our economy and politics, uh, mobilization of science uh, towards political and economic ends. And uh, the Manhattan Project is the exemplar of that. There were a lot of those that happened uh, during uh, World War II. But, you know, if you look at the uh, science prior to that, uh, it was actually vigorous. You know, there was a lot of interesting stuff going on. I'm, again, I'm speaking of academic science right now. Um, uh, the focus was on basic questions. Uh, uh, it was fertile. It was vital. Um, and, a wide diversity uh, of hypotheses too, right? That's what's so fascinating about 19th century science. It's just so many different absolutely. ideas and uh, some of them absolutely. completely outlandish, but still entertained yeah. quite seriously. Yeah, yeah so that, absolutely. That, and you, and, and, and uh, uh, keep me on track if I diverge too much. But uh, when you talk about the history of 19th century 
evolutionism, for example, you know, we have a very narrow conception of it. You know, first there was all these crazy, uh, you know, vitalist ideas from Cuvier and Lamarck, and then came Darwin, and then that was it. That was all there was. And if you look at the diversity of evolutionary thought in the late 19th century, it was incredibly rich and incredibly um, vital. And, uh, and uh, of course, one of the things that happened with the emergence of the of the uh, you know the Fisher Haldane Wright uh, idea of population genetics and uh, uh, selection, it sort of became set in stone. And uh, and I'm sure there are some other cultural issues that were going on there. But uh, but you know just to underscore your point that 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 yes there have been periods when scientific thought has been incredibly rich and varied and lots of different competing hypotheses. But coming back, to and it happened to the, be separated from the state at that point in time, which is really fascinating. You're absolutely right, and and uh, you know the 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 big thing that happened at, at, in the aftermath of World War II was that, of course, uh, you know everyone looked at the atomic scientists as having basically made it possible to win the war uh, over Germany and Japan, and there was this move uh basically by uh by people who'd been instrumental in this uh in this effort during the Roosevelt administration to set up a the National Science Foundation which had the aim of fostering basic science in the universities that uh, we would grant money to academic scientists at a scale that no one had ever really done before um and uh, and that worked for a while, you know, it worked as long as the scientists who had grown up and, and matured in the uh, in the atmosphere prior to World War II, where it was there were there was greater um, attention or prominence placed on intellectual freedom and so forth. One of the consequences of the federal government actually coming in to uh, basically try to fertilize basic science in the universities is that uh, the influence of that money has got so great and uh, so uh, powerful that it's actually trans fundamentally transformed the culture of science. You know, now discovery is not so important as bringing in grant money. And uh, um, and if you don't bring in grant money, sufficient grant money, you're somehow penalized. And of course, the the uh, most stark example of that recently is are the last, uh, well, this year's uh, awardees of the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, you know, uh, Catalin Carrico, who was one of the uh, one of the two people who were honored thereby, you know, she was, uh, she was in trouble with her university because, uh, you know, she was not bringing in enough grant money to the university, which is basically an institutional imperative rather than an intellectual imperative. And so you have this striking contrast between the institutional priorities for science, which is geared towards money, compared to the intellectual pursuit, which in the case of Catalan and Carrico, uh, was Nobel Prize worthy, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's geared towards money in a way that's predictable and reliable, right? I, I assume she was working on something that wasn't in some pathway that was known to be a predictable and, and fruitful line of work because that's where discoveries come from is is from the outside it seems like in a sense it's like there's been a uh, a constriction of the economy of f the free market on ideas by mm -hmm. virtue of the fact that there's only certain reliable ideas that are worthy of funding which makes sense from it like if you're trying to strangle an economy or like guide it very like firm heavy-handedly but it doesn't result in a lot of innovation at the end. And I think there's been some pretty convincing uh, meta-analyses of the halting of, you know, the accumulation Disruptive of innovation. discoveries. Yeah, discovery. I mean, yeah. uh, it's interesting because I feel like a lot of the stuff is really fundamental research and super basic research. And the where it's not the the same as developing a really really expensive particle d detector or something that takes you billions and billions of dollars these are really basic theoretical principles about the nature of biology and so while i think that Shiloh, you're right about the influence of money 
on science and the strangling of disruptive research and the role that peer review has played. And Scott, you're right about the the industrialization of science after World War II. I'm like, these are ideas that you just need to 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 have. Like they don't take any money. You can read, you can go out into the world and you can look at stuff and you can come up with these ideas. There has to be something else that's preventing people from thinking and talking about purpose and desire in context of biology that goes far beyond funding structures and the the broken peer review system. Because people even behind closed doors are reluctant to say these things. It's it's verboten on a spiritual level to talk about purpose and desire in biology as being something that we must fold into the theoretical underpinnings in order to understand life. That's what's weird to me because that doesn't take any money. Yeah, that that's right. And and you know, I I uh, um, from my personal experience, my major research expense was an annual air ticket to Namibia to do my studies and it didn't bring in a lot of money you know I um, and I at at first I had you know I, I've I've had I hate to sound like a, a fogey here but uh, you know you know my my career has been long enough to where I've been able to see the transformation you know when I first started doing this people said oh well, that's interesting you know go ahead and do it it sounds good never mind the grant money you know we like you doing this but at the end of my career you know it was uh, uh, the 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 pressure to bring in grant money just for the sake of having grant money was much stronger and. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, um, and this has been throughout science, and and when you have that kind of pressure, you know, careers are tied up into it, and uh, and then you gradually change people's thinking. You know, um, um, there was a very uh, interesting study that came out a couple of years ago in issues in science and uh, technology. Stephen Turner and Daryl Chubin. Stephen Turner is no relation to me. And they documented this uh, quite uh, quite clearly, you know. Whereas uh, uh, forty years ago, the individual investigator was respected, and uh, and and you know, okay, this is someone who's going off on their own. That's essential to what we do. Um, let's hope something comes of it, and uh, and so forth. But aside from that, uh, you know, your career was safe if you took a risk. In fact, that's what tenure is supposed to protect. It's supposed to protect people taking intellectual risks. Um, but as as those people, namely me, <laughs> have been replaced by the inevitable uh, actuarial tables, uh, you know, a new class of, of uh, well, a new cultural milieu for science has been set up where where careers depend upon conformity, on groupthink, uh, uh, all these other other kinds of things that go along with a corporatized uh, picture of what science is, and and uh, you know I and proportionally I wonder, the tenure like the tenure positions aren't there right there there's so many people working under these blankets right uh, far below the layer of tenure I mean there's hardly any tenure positions available considering the number of PhDs that are coming up. So it's not yeah, tenure, really yep. there as a it's not really there for most scientists. That's right. You know, we're kind of overproducing uh, PhDs, and at the same time, we're eroding the protections of tenure, all of which uh, um, are are uh, basically undermining what tenure is supposed to do and what academic careers are supposed to do, which is to protect the ability to take intellectual risks. You know, now the uh, the the path to tenure. Um, and again, this is starkly illustrated by the tale of Catalan Carrico, our Nobel Prize, co-Nobel Prize uh, winner for physiology or medicine this year. She was actually demoted and stripped of her academic rank because she wasn't bringing in enough money, you know, and the metrics for success are grants brought in, numbers of papers published, which is itself a kind of incestuous uh, uh, thing that has uh, that has developed over the past uh, you know, 10 years or so, um, and other kinds of factors that are just irrelevant to what we're supposed to be doing as university scientists, which is taking intellectual risks, exploring basic questions, um, trying to gain new insights into the nature of the universe rather than trying to to make uh, 
new particle accelerators. As important as those things are, I don't want to diminish that, but it's a different kind of science. I think that there's something, you know, good art often comes from people that are kind of crazy. And (laughs) we have a decent space in our society for the insanity of the artist, the poet, the writer, the novelist. It's it's interesting. Under the bridge. (laughs) Under the bridge, but also, you know, the hermit in the cabin. There's there's lots of space for it. But there isn't much space for the mad scientist anymore. And on one level, I think that I understand where that comes from because there's a long history of exclusion of access to science, that there's only one type of person who can do science, that only one type of person's ideas get centered. And so I get that. But I read about somebody like Carrie Mullis. Mm -hmm. And he's kind of a psycho. Uh, He, at one point, uh, is interviewed by this journalist and multiple time propositions her for sex during the interview. And she ends up writing a very abbreviated profile of the guy because she's like, I literally cannot be in a room alone with him and I need hours and so I can't do this. He has multiple wives. He's just, nobody likes him ever across the course of his career. And he has one or two friends that basically put him in a room and they're like, Carrie, I know you're brilliant, but just go away. Like, go work in this room. Don't touch anything else. And he's a beautiful writer. Just, just on the, I don't know if you read his Nobel Prize speech, but it's just this incredibly evocative portrait of a man that sees the cosmic significance of everything and his work is kind of centered on that. But I think that Carrie Mullis in today's climate would not remain a scientist. I think that he would be pushed out because he's... (laughs) Cancelled. I hate to use the word cancelled because it's so culture worry, but I just... And I I don't know how to deal with it because I'm like, how how do you deal with the fact that you have brilliant people that suck? that make it impossible to work with them and that take up all these spaces and resources that could be distributed otherwise. And what is the role of science? What is the value of the genius versus the collective? And it's, 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 it's at the center of all the culture war stuff that we have going on right now. Yeah, absolutely. And in addition to his Nobel Prize speech, Kerry Mullis is one of my favorite uh, examples of uh, a lot of things that have gone wrong in modern science. There's his autobiography, Dancing Naked in the Mind Field. Uh, that's 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 a, uh, a read that I would recommend to everyone. But It's so uh, well you know, written. He's such so an evocative written. writer. Yeah, and and he's a little crazy. He's a little, you know, touched in the head a little bit. There's no doubt about it. Especially if you read his his depiction of of how he came up with the idea of the polymerase uh, uh, chain reaction. And if you look at um, uh, a lot of figures like this, and we can name a number of them: uh, Kerry Mullis, uh, James Watson, uh, uh, William Shockley, for example. You know, uh, and we can go on and on. We could, well, you know, uh, Edward Cope that I mentioned uh, earlier, he was an absolute nutcase. And, of course, out, what what comes out of this is often just more craziness. But nevertheless, there's this kind of spark of genius there that can sometimes emerge. And so what is the role of our universities? What are we supposed to expect our universities to do? And I have always thought that what universities do is, well, it's a brilliant solution to what to do with these crazy people who uh, might have real sparks of genius. And of course, we evaluate them, we look at them uh, from time to time to make sure that they're not just, uh, you know, booching off of uh, of uh, everyone else, that they're doing productive things and so forth. And there really only has to be one productive thing that comes out of a scientist's career, you know, as long as it's big enough, like the, you know, invention of the transistor and the invention of the polymerase chain reaction or whatnot, that can actually justify our our, um, investment, if you will, in universities as places for the crazy to occur. And, uh, and, uh, you know, 
we've really lost sight of that, you know, as we've become more corporatized, as science has become more of a revenue stream for universities rather than something that, uh, that uh, you know, um, is uh, vital to the fundamental function of a university, we really have lost that. And you mentioned uh, earlier, Shiloh, some, some uh, meta uh, analyses of, of, how often breakthrough papers or as it's been called disruptive papers come along if you look at what's uh, happening we're producing papers by the millions literally every year but if you look at the kinds of uh, papers that actually disrupt things the kinds of things that we should be doing in academic research right now that's had no effect on them we've had breakthroughs there's no doubt about it but these have occurred at more or less a steady rate quite independent of the numbers of papers we publish the amount of money that's spent on it and so forth and and uh, somehow you know i think we need to recover that and part of the university thing uh, you mentioned anastasia the purpose and desire um somehow there has to be a safe space for talking about that again for actually being able to uh redirect our discourse over evolution in a way that is possible in universities and of course as we've seen a couple of times uh, that becomes increasingly difficult uh, as we have become more and more corporatized as scientists I would definitely agree with that. I mean, I I also feel like that's an inherent limitation of institutions, where institutions are made to be conservative and to uphold whatever came before. And especially when you start to get, when you had only a couple of really big universities, I think that it was maybe different because it was still on the scale that people could know each other and attend all the same meetings, right? You look at the Solvay conference mm -hmm. and there's, I don't know, 70 people there. And that's basically mm -hmm. like everyone that is focused on this question that matters yeah. is in that yeah. room. Yeah. And you can't have that anymore, even with something like the origin of life. There's so many people that are working on this question that you would need, you'd need halls and halls and halls to fill it. It's way beyond Dunbar's number. It's no mm -hmm. longer this intimate thing where it's like, okay, we have a question. We are working on solving it together. It's, okay, there's a pool of funding. Everyone needs to get at the pool of funding. We need to organize ourselves into successively smaller cliques so that we can differentiate ourselves from the other person. And we all operate within the sense that Darwinian evolution is the thing that matters. And I just, I feel like the only answer to that is to start to build institutions that are parallel to the universities. Like, accept that the universities will do this periodically. Like, they go through phases, we've reached a maximum size. It almost reminds me of the inevitable collapse of the Soviet Union or something, mm. where you just have this, like, bureaucratic bloat, and you have this attempt to strangle the economy and direct everything from above, even though the people at the top have no idea what's going on at the floor. And, and when you lose that autonomy from the bottom up, or you lose that ability for them to direct their own intentions, right? You're almost taking the life, literally, out of the system by doing that. And like, so maybe the inevitability is a fracturing and collapse of those superstructures. Because they're going to start evaluating grants using AI soon, right? Because think about how much time and effort and energy goes into reading those mm -hmm. stupid grant applications, right? And I mean, they're, they're going to design a system and the system is going to be parameterized in such a way that it effectively, according to a couple of points, evaluates whether or not the grant hits the metrics. And then money will be allocated that way. And once you have that system in place... And then people just optimize for it. I mean, they already. I are. think it's just end times. I just, I literally, you just, you see this generator function. It's like the thing where one AI feeds the other one and it collapses into noise. You, mm -hmm. once you have an algorithm that you're optimizing for, I think that that must be what happens. You just hit some. And there's kind even of an even greater role for the administrators to strangle the research <laughs> at that point. I mean, it occurred to me last night. It was kind of funny. I just realized that the administrators at my university have much something much more approximating tenure than I do. Like they, they really, you know, they, as long as they just do their function and so forth, they they can be there for 40 years, but you know, it's not quite so clear cut for a professor, especially a teaching professor or something like that. Yeah. I mean, the logical conclusion of, uh, of that uh, dynamic that you mentioned, uh, Anastasia is that, uh, okay. Uh, you'll have AI producing the papers, uh, AI doing the reviewing, 
and AI doing the uh, other kinds of evaluations. And humans never need to be involved in, in this. It's all machine driven and all, me all mechanistically driven. But, you know, when you, when you say that maybe it's time to start uh, uh, looking at other institutions uh, for people to do science, it's, it's, it's it's becoming increasingly evident to me that universities are no longer friendly places for the basic sciences. So uh, they, they the the kinds of things that go into uh, a fruitful um, program of basic science um, uh, is no longer valued in universities, and it's it's because of this enormous amount of money that's uh, streaming into it. And and the uh, example I like to to use is. Um, in the early 19th century in England, you had something called the Lunar Society, and it included uh, uh, luminaries like uh, Erasmus Darwin, James Watt, um, uh, a whole bunch of the, the, the Wedgwoods. Uh, of course, Wedgwood was a potter, but he was very interested in, in uh, how you mobilize energy to produce beautiful pottery and so forth. And this was an incredibly diverse and kind of crazy group of people. I mean, they called themselves the Lunar Society because they all sort of uh, considered themselves to be touched by a bit of lunacy. And mm -hmm. and this was one of the, one of the transformational uh, intellectual events in, in the history of England, basically, and the history of the Western world, you know, namely, how is it that you can mobilize energy to fuel the industrial revolution? And, and of course, there's disputes about it. But this was something that did not involve any universities. It was just a club of people. Um, they had a, uh, uh, some of them had a source of income, such as, uh, uh, such as the Wedgwoods, for example, but others were just kind of getting together to talk about weird stuff, you know, and, uh, and it led to actually one of the greatest uh, intellectual transformations, I think, in the history of our civilization. And, and uh, you know, when you talk about current um, uh, institutions, I don't think there's any way you can get away from institutions as as a uh, as a place in which to do science. But you're really talking about institutions where the ability to do science is valued and where it's supported and. Uh, one of the things that I think we might think about doing is actually leaving as scientists, leaving the universities and setting up small independent uh, independent uh, entities where 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 now scientists are in control of their destiny rather than being governed by administrators or uh, monetary imperatives and uh, those 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 kinds of things. And you see that happening. Uh, um, uh, for example, if you look at, uh, this is going to be a weird, uh, seem like a weird segue, but it's just something that I've written about lately. You know, if you look at polar bear science, you know, you have the preferred narrative that polar bears are endangered and, uh, you know, they're all going to die because of climate change and, and, and so forth. And this is coming from uh, private um, entities that are set up as separate corporations that rely on charitable donations and, and so forth. Okay, that's fair enough. It takes money to pay people and whatnot. But if you look at the diversity of these private organizations dealing with the problem of polar bears around the Antarctic, there's a diversity of, of these. And what's governing this is the free will of donations that support these activities. And so, for example, you have donors from Sierra Club type people, for example, and they're going to like one narrative. Then you have uh, donors from other political perspectives. And what you end up with there is something akin to a free market of ideas and uh, something that you don't really get with the conformity that comes along with uh, with this overall uh, government funding of science. And uh, among them is we have a very good uh, understanding of the diversity of polar bear uh, biology. We understand uh, something about resilience. We understand something about uh, their populations. And this has all been fueled by basically donors making a free choice in what kinds of science they will support. And, you know, we tend to look askance at this, you know, I think, oh, well, your science is just biased by, by you know, the will of the, uh, by the desires of the donors. But in fact, if you have a diversity of donors uh, contributing to this, you'll actually get a diverse, a diverse and free market of ideas coming out of it. And, and so, you know, I agree with you, you know, I think it's time for us to be thinking about 
alternative places where we can actually be scientists and uh, i mean if i can pat myself on the back a little bit right now i i think that's in some sense what we're trying to do too with this show and i think that there has been a huge victory in in the podcast space in terms of reawakening the spirit of communication and like i i like to bring people who are a little bit lunatics on this show from time to time because i think that there are really interesting ideas in the craziest of people and maybe like 99 percent of their ideas are nuts but there are really really interesting things to happen there and i think these you know if everything works out in my life we will have built an institution that can potentially mm-hmm. live beyond us or if not it doesn't matter but we will have built something that ha- that hosts that and facilitates that kind of spirit that's necessary in the scientific world today and i know there's a number of other uh you know media enterprises that are are pursuing the same goal and i I don't think it's insignificant the fact that people are willing to sit here for three hours and listen to a conversation is not insignificant that that people want to participate who are in the public who might not be scientists they they are interested in being a part of these conversations and um I think there's really something optimistic about that. Yeah, there yeah. I mean there's also another It's been very good to see the response because people clearly enjoy conversations that are outside of the only intellectual frame that is presented from within the academy. But something that I think about a lot when it comes to the fracturing of perspectives where you have these outside institutions and everybody has their own baseline and their own money and they start to come up with conclusions that are related to what their base wants is that those that new system can only work if we have a really strict value on honesty and accuracy because we all know that data can be manipulated basically in any number of ways to be difficult to tease apart and is very effective at getting people to see what you want them to see. And something that is at least a central value of the academy is being careful with your data, being careful with your experiments, being careful with your conclusions. But that neutrality almost definitionally gets eroded when you're being supported by people that are interested in seeing some desired outcome. Like with the climate stuff, it's just all so centered on the downstream political implications. And so it's not just polar bear research. It's it's not about the polar bears. It's about what are we going to do politically downstream? What does it mean for us as humans? Are humans good? Are humans bad? There are these massive, almost theological conclusions that come out of this research where the research is not the thing in itself. What it does is it's 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 the building block of something else. And when we're talking about science that's doing that, I I feel like the primary directive for building these institutions, like what we're trying to do at the podcast, is to build with values in mind first. Because you cannot just be a scientist. You must have a strong set of values for what it means to do science and what it is you're trying to do with that science. And it can't be to just fight for your side or to make presentations that advance your belief system. It's tied into... Uh, who, what the interests are of the funders of the research. And there are a couple of problems there. One is that uh, if you look at the, uh, the, the the total amount of funding that's coming into universities from, say, the federal government, this is just the federal government now, you're talking about uh, about 60% of the total is coming from government sources. And so you have an inherent conflict of interest. If the government wants science done, uh, then they are going to be setting uh, the priorities. And so you've gone away from the w- what should be the basic role of science is the inter- interface of science and politics now. Uh, you've gone away from that where the, where the interests of the funders are now dominating and scientists are no longer the provide leaders of, of independent intellectual advice so that policymakers can make sound judgments. And when you talk about the polar bears or even uh, climate change, for example, you're there's no way around inevitably political questions. You know, should we save the polar bears? You know, that's a that's in itself a political question. And 
right now, uh, uh, because you have one set of interests, namely government uh, uh, funding the lion's share of this, then you're going to get science that's going to give them what they want, you know? And so, and so when you're talking about, you know, the interests of people who are funding scientists uh, and scientists have needs, you know, they have jobs, they have careers and so forth. What is likely to get us back to this um, uh, ideal idea of scientists providing it disinterested, intellectual, independent advice um, I'm I'm not seeing much of a problem with there being private donors as long as there's a diversity of private donors, because when uh, someone decides to contribute to Polar Bears International, for example, they're going to have one set of political political interests. When someone decides to um, uh, 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 donate to the Heartland Institute, for example, which also maintains its own polar bear uh, research uh, program, they're going to have a different set of political interests. And so, the, the ideal is what you're go- is is that you'll have a diversity of answers to the questions: Should we protect polar bears or not? Do, are they in need of protection? And so forth, and and uh, and you know that to me is going to be uh, 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 um, uh, more of a fostering climate for for producing what science scientific advice should be providing, which is diversity of perspectives and, and whatnot, than than our uh, current situation. Having said that, you're absolutely right. It depends upon the in, uh, on on the integrity of the individual scientists, the respect for the data. Um, the willingness to put the data out for others to evaluate objectively and to engage in the kind of debate that uh, should be going on in the sciences. You know, that's what drives science and knowledge forward is, you know, okay, we have this unknown, you have one perspective, we have this other perspective, you know, let's discuss it, let's hash it out over the data and so forth. And I'm not sure we're doing that right now in a number of uh, scientific areas where government has a very strong interest. I think that there's also this, oh, did you want to say something? Well, I just want to say, it seems like scientists need to be the eyes and ears on nature. And it's almost mm-hmm. like, especially as the gov- our government in the West is in increasingly captured by corporate interests and so forth it's almost like it's turned into a sort of headless horseman right if, it, if it's not really interested in what its eyes and ears are telling it and it's interested in making up what the eyes and ears should be telling it then we find ourselves in a really blinded space where we could be making decisions that could lead us off a cliff without even realizing they're happening because we've closed off those channels in what sense do you have like a specific thing you're thinking of when you say that? Just in terms of science, just in terms of the uh, free market of ideas. If there's not really a free market of ideas, and there's only certain ideas which are fundable, and those certain ideas are lockstep with the corporate interests, which aren't really driven by human processes, they're really just growth-oriented algorithms. You lose the ability to actually make objective sense of the universe and make decisions, yeah. even at a political level, that are based on objective understanding of nature so i agree but i'll play devil's advocate here and i'll say what if the the argument is that the consensus is accurate and that spending any time or energy on something that falls outside of the consensus is by definition a waste of time because it's like flat earth but it can't be because we know the consensus has been radically wrong continually throughout the development of science right it has but sometimes it's right like for example you have uh we were, t- we're we're like writing this book about the history of physics and one of the things that i'm really trying to piece together is the emergence of the idea of the atom and the maintenance of the idea of the atom and it turns out that the ancient greeks through the romans had a sense that matter was made of atoms And then in the Middle Ages, that is replaced with this Aristotelian continuum of substance that takes different behaviors and various mixtures of the substances appear. Spirits. Spirits. And then some guy, his name's Isaac Beekman, uh, is is basically like, nah, I think it's corpuscles. And then he meets Rene Descartes when Descartes is young tells Descartes about his corpuscular theories on matter, and then it kind of kicks off the entire intellectual climate that develops downstream. And I'm like, okay, so we had a consensus on atoms, and then somebody was like, 
no, no, no. We, uh, that free market of ideas. We have a better idea. And then people are like, vitalism. And they go with vitalism for like a thousand years. And then it takes you all this time to get back to the starting point of no stuff is made of other stuff. And so it's, I, I just, I think it's very reasonable to take a stand that, hey, some ideas we fix in position. Like there's, there's, there's this guy who runs this thing called the Tychosium and he has created a mathematically perfect model of how Earth is actually stationary and it is at the center of our solar system. And all of the stars are much closer in than they should be. And it's mathematically perfect. Mm. But I'm like, to switch your allegiance from the model that we have of the solar, of the heliocentric solar system to a mathematically perfect one that breaks that consensus, like, is that something science should do? Does it matter that it's mathematically perfect? Is it, is it, is it meaningful? Or is it just some trick of the math and is consensus is fine and we stick with that and we just go in that direction because it prevents us from this endless just churn of the same idea over and over and over again. And of course, there has to be a space for this uh, this anti-consensus uh, approach, you know, and, and uh, the case of the solar system is an interesting one, you know, when... When uh, Copernicus first uh, proposed his idea, I, I recall reading that the uh, ephemerides that uh, navigators used to get around the Ptolemaic system actually provided more accurate uh, uh, models for the position of stars and so forth. And, and so in a practical sense, uh, um, the uh, Ptolemaic consensus uh, might have been perfectly useful and mathematically perfect, uh, as you say, but uh, um, you know, in 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 the end, did it really conform to reality? And you have a similar kind of uh, consensus uh, that built up actually around the concept of the gene. You know that the gene is a determinative. Uh, uh, thing that it's inherited uh, across generations without any impact of the adaptation of the uh, organism's lifetime that can be transmitted onto future generations. And uh, that was consensus for a long time, you know, a long, long time. And we still talk about the gene as a thing when it's really kind of a process. You know, you um, if you look at the translation of a, of a nucleotide sequence into function, there's just an incredible amount of modification and whatnot that goes on in that. You can have one stretch of DNA, for example, uh, coding for multiple different kinds of proteins. And, and in what sense, then, is the gene a thing anymore? You know, we should think about the gene perhaps more as a process than as a thing and yet the uh the the consensus is that you know the, the, and and in terms of how we tend to speak about it um uh, the, the gene itself is 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 an illusion really it's a it it uh, doesn't let you see some of the fundamental things about what genes do and uh and uh, of course, that emergence was hampered for a long time by this consensus that the gene is a sequence of nucleotides and it encodes something, and that's that's just it. You know, it encodes a protein, and that turns out not to be the case so much anymore. And so, I'm always in favor of undermining consensus. I don't really believe that there's such a thing as consensus. I think there's an agreement that, oh, well, we're going to pursue this for a while, you know, and we're going to go along with it. But um, ultimately, there has to be a place for people who can come in and tear that consensus down. And I think the universities should be the place for that, but increasingly they're not. I just think that there's so much science that has to do with outcomes, right? So, if you if you zoom out and you ask yourself the question of like what is the point of science? On one hand it's mechanism, right? It's to just be able to say that this is the way that something works. Cause of effect. Cause of effect. But then there's also this other part of it which is now that we know that what are we going to do with it? And I think that that's where engineering Engineering comes in, but it's also values. It's also belief structures. And it's also uh, this kind of 
fortune telling where you look into the crystal ball and you're like, this is what I want to aim for. And if I understand mechanism correctly, then I aim for this thing. And so I guess I have a belief that there is some center from where you can stand and say, this is a flag I plant and I'm confident in the planting of this flag. And when someone comes around to undermine it on the basis of undermining consensus, what they're doing is they're actively preventing people from being able to make sensible decisions about bringing about the future that they actually want. And that, I don't know what to do about that. I'm not saying that I know the answer to this. I'm just saying that this is from a metaphysical perspective i'm like you must be able to plant flags that you say this is planted we operate with this like this is what laws are right like an object in motion will tend to stay in motion somebody who comes up and is like well i want to challenge that consensus i'm like does that what does that give us does that just create noise or is it a Um, worthwhile consensus to undermine well, at least in terms of of Newton's laws, yes, it has proven to be a consensus to undermine. And of course, the whole relativity revolution is and uh, the quantum revolution is was part of that. And and so, again, you know, I, I I think there's something that we can all agree on temporarily to to maybe explore the. Uh, um, explore the implications uh, of it uh, you know and that's what of course thomas kuhn called normal science there's certainly a place for that uh, but there always has to be uh, someone or something that's going to undermine that and i guess i think in the case of the the newtonian worldview uh, it was clearly i clearly came about at the beginning of the 20th century and uh since you are working on a uh, on, on on a book about the history of science, you must know about David Kayser's book about that, uh, how the hippies saved physics. Have you run across this book? No. Oh, how the hippies saved physics, and it has to do with actually the way that uh, that uh, the whole quantum revolution was was uh, um, was treated when it first came out. You know, there's there's something called Bell's theorem. It, it's involved with uh, it's involved with uh, with a, a quantum entanglement. And I actually, and- uh, this is a funny story. I found John Clauser's f- phone number on the internet. Uh, and the other day, I just called him up, and I was like, "You need to come talk to oh. us about Bell's inequality." And he's like, Maybe. "Oh, okay, all <laughs> he right." Promise yeah. you'd come in February. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, David Kayser's book uh, uh, treats how that was received, you know, and of course, uh, as as we all know, there's all kinds of uh, crazy, spooky implications of uh, quantum mechanics and uh, and quantum physics, and and uh one of the um things that happened after world war ii um richard Feynman uh, discusses this uh, to some extent in his autobiography um the entire process of university physics uh academic physics was taken over by uh the incredible amount of money that started to flow into that from the federal government and uh and uh Feynman characterizes the climate that was uh, developed thereby to be shut up and compute you know that was supposed to be the the be all end all of of university scientists and university physicists a bigger pardon and one of the consequences was that the people who wanted to explore these kinds of spooky implications of 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 quantum mechanics were sort of uh, driven out of the universities and they ended up uh, in these kinds of fringe uh, uh, groups where they uh, actually were finally free to explore these ideas, but they were fringe groups like the Esalen Institute and uh, some other other kinds of uh, other kinds of places. And yet out of that, they were actually man they actually managed to find a place where they could they had the freedom to explore these strange ideas. And of course, uh, you know, Bell's theorem is now coming to be uh, awfully important, you know, several decades after it was after it was uh, first proposed. and and this to me is another example of how how um, how uh, the generous support of academic physics academic science uh, had an unfortunate consequence of 
basically imposing a level of conformity, imposing a, a certain level of demand and specificity on what are we getting for our money that was actually uh, not friendly to the kinds of uh, really fundamentally basic explorations of the nature of the atom. And, and, uh, and uh, again, here's a situation where the consensus was misguided for a while because of the the interests of the groups that were funding it, you know? And so where do you, where do you find that safe space? And in the case of uh, the, the, the quantum physicists, it was outside the universities. Hmm. Yeah. I think it's worth noting that it's not just some passive aversion to new ideas, right? There's this absolutely hmm. rabid defense of consensus, which is a really emotionally fraught area that plays into all of this. You know, there's people who make their, entire careers by defending ideas that will almost certainly be displaced in 500, 1,000 years. And I've always found that is very curious that people are willing to devote their lives to the conservation of sort of decaying old ideas. Mm -hmm. and I don't know where that comes from, but it, it seems to be a real force in the world. Well, it's belief, right? I, yeah. I, I, it's hard for me to see science as anything except for a type of religion. Because it's a belief system. We saw this during the last couple of years, right? How many how many signs did you see believe in science, trust in science, people identifying as being believers of science? And I'm like, okay, well, if it's a belief structure, then it's a religion. And if it's a religion, then you have saints and apostles and you have central tenets. And so Darwin is a saint. And if you're like, Darwin was wrong... Well, that's that's heresy if you say that Einstein was wrong. <laughs> that's heresy if you say that Feynman was wrong. Again, and they're not burning people at the stakes and there's not, you know, the Knights Templar or whatever. But it definitely has a vibe of you shall not, you know, utter the uh, the word of God or, or the name of God, right? Like you, there, there's a certain sense of... <laughs> of a set of rules that you cannot violate because when you violate them, you violate the moral precepts of the belief system, which begins at the place where you bestow these figures with uncorruptible sainthood. Like I have read Carl Wosey's papers where he's like our great prophet Darwin mm. at the beginning of the papers or something like that, right? It's this language where Darwin was the, the greatest idea that ever emerged out of science and all hail those ideas. And you can't... You What's can't, really funny too is that I, I find that that things like forces and evolution could easily be substituted for the hand of God, right? It's like you, you put this sciencey sounding word on it, but it's like, what are you talking about? Like you're talking about this invisible force that's guiding the unfolding of events on the planet. It, it's not... I think this is what you were trying to get at at the beginning with the unsatisfying circular... Uh, explanatory power of some of these concepts is that they, they sound sciencey on their face, but they, they're very much just stand-ins for some superstitious forces or something like that. It's even like people, when it comes to like explaining basic fundamental things like gravity or something, it's like, it's a force or, or it's a, it's a warping of some concept like space time. It's like, that's not really an explanation. That's just a description of what's happening. It's, it's maybe quantitatively useful for rockets and everything else, but it's like we haven't really, really spent much time on the fundamental mechanistic aspect of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, and, the, you know, in, in the case of uh, of uh, evolution, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, Darwin is treated as this secular saint. And, and uh, um, you know, I, I'm a adm frank admirer of, of Charles Darwin, but uh, uh, we have really lost something in how we teach students about evolution by by conferring this kind of uh, sainthood uh, upon him. And it does lead to some uh, um, uh, a kind of proliferation of metaphors, uh, if you will, that, that, that sound very good, but uh, don't really carry a lot of explanatory power. So, uh, for example, <clears throat> The ecological niche is one of these kinds of uh, kinds of concepts, and uh, uh, G. Evelyn Hutchinson, who who was a 
was a uh, very important figure in the uh, development of physiological ecology and uh, and and those kinds of fields. Very very influential. But his idea was based upon something called an ecological niche, you know, and, and uh, uh, it was a very interesting approach to it. He said, well, you know, if you look at the physiology of organisms, they fit into certain sets of environmental circumstances, and that's the nature of adaptation. And from that, you had a kind of a reification of the concept of the niche to the point where these niches existed out there somewhere. There was a whole mathematical theory around it, and that evolution was governed by organisms evolving into a niche. And so, for example, um, if you look at uh, the kinds of uh, creatures that hunt insects, flying insects, you know, you have bats and you have swallows and and those those kinds of kinds of creatures. And and it's actually been said that uh, oh well, you know, bats have evolved to fill the nighttime flying insect predator niche, whereas the swallows have evolved to fit the daytime uh, flying insect predator niche. And and the, the notion that these niches exist rather than are actually being constructed, part of an active construction of an environment that's suitable for these things, um, it's it's led to a kind of a reification of the niche, you know, mm. and it's a similar lack of explanatory power. Oh, well, swallows have evolved in this way because they're evolving to fit the daytime flying predator, insect predator niche. But it doesn't exist. <laughs> the niche doesn't exist. It's one of these things where, where you've reified something, you've made it an object, and you've built an entire elegant theory around it but it's really based on on you know fairy dust in oh, my view so interesting because it's exactly at the heart of the modern physics crisis too all of these concepts have been reified into physical actors when it's yeah. just not what's yeah. truly being talked about and i feel yeah. like people have kind of lost sight they're so comfortable with the reifications and they're yeah. in some sense they're technologically functional reifications but again where where does the science fit into that yeah yeah all right, so I have I have one last question. Um, you've mentioned several times that you know, like the termites aren't that intelligent and so forth. Um, what do you, what is intelligence to you? Uh, well, um, <laughs> <laughs> nervous laughter. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. It's a difficult concept. It's like consciousness, you know. It, it, it's one of these difficult concepts that it's 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 a uh, it's it's easy to fall into traps on. Um, what I have uh, done, okay, I tell people that we're really basing this thinking around the concept of cognition and. And I always preface this by saying that I'm stretching, I'm pushing this as far as I can reasonably get away with. So it's very much of a, very much of a tactic. But um, the basic structure of 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 of, uh, of how I think of evolution is centered around what I call adaptive interfaces, and the cell membrane is one example of an adaptive interface, for example. And what that does is it senses the environment. It the cell has a notion of what it's supposed to be, for example, and it mobilizes matter and information, uh, and that varies depending upon what the external environment is going to be. Right, and so. Um, and so that's the basic function of what we're talking about. So you have knowledge of the uh, environment, for example, as sensed by whatever is in the cell membrane or at any other scale, you know, our senses and whatnot. That's conveyed to some, some you know, system on the other side of this adaptive boundary. Could be the cell interior, could be the interior of the body, could be the interior of the kidney and so forth. And then decisions are made to be able to um, adjust the intake of matter and energy to the environmental circumstances. So there's knowledge of the outside, knowledge of what the system is supposed to be, and some means of manipulating it. So when we talk about intelligence, we're really talking about the kind of um, uh, that, that 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 kind of system as a whole, if you will. You know, when you're acting intelligently, you're taking in information, you're considering it, uh, whatnot, and then you're taking some kind of rational action that's going to be consistent with your 
survival, basically. And, like and you're maximizing the, the utility of your decisions or something. Yeah, yeah. And so and so again, that that to me is the foundation of intelligence. And and like I say, I'm 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 stretching that as far as I think I can get away with. Now that doesn't mean that um, you know, a cell thinks about things the same way that a brain does for example and uh you know the the more complex it gets the more um the more um elaborate the intelligence uh, gets to be and and so you know when we talk about ourselves we're we're talking really about all right well what's the appropriate metaphor for thinking about an intelligent system, which is, of course, our brains. Uh, this is combined with all the information that's coming into it. Uh, should we think about uh, our brain as a computer, very complex computer, or should we think about it in some other way? And and if we think about it in terms of a computer, we're missing a lot of very important things about how brains actually work. You know, they have redundant systems of transmitters. They have uh, an organization of the brain in a particular way, collections of cells, uh, trying to control other collections of cells and so forth. Uh, the whole role of the uh, of the supporting cells, the neuroglia, what do they do? Are they somehow tied into um into the production of intelligence and all of these things you don't really get with the computing metaphor for the brain and this i think is one of the big fallacies of the artificial intelligence thing you know what we spoke about earlier art uh, you know computers cannot um cannot um want things they simply are not able to do anything but reflect the desires of whoever has built them and um and like in that and, sense, and, you almost see the individual termites as these computing uh, organisms, whereas the overall superorganism has more ability to maximize utility. It has this more willful intelligence that it expresses compared to the individual uh, units. Yeah, I think so. But I would actually go further and say that uh, termites are actually intelligent creatures on their own. You know, it's a uh, um, if you. Well, I had one year where I was the only person on site, and I was looking at the at the behavior of termites, and and as a result, I spent a lot of time in a dark room just watching termites and uh, under a microscope. And uh, uh, this may have been a bout of temporary insanity brought about by this kind of intense observation of these termites, but it became clear to me that uh, termites are cognitive beings. They live a rich cognitive life. They make decisions. They uh, they are motivated by uh, by wants. Basically, you have different individuals who are initiators of of activity, and others who are followers. and And uh, and and so, if you spend more time looking at termites as as termites, and I would say this would be true for uh, any living system, uh, taking it at its own value on on the uh, on a spatial value. Uh, then it becomes very hard to sustain the notion that uh, that intelligence is a computation rather than a uh, acting out of a desire, basically. And uh, and so, you know, um, I think that this I is where the reification it, of evolution gets complicated, right? Because if yes. evolution is a designer, and you see people all the time, evolution designed this system, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. all of a sudden you have the same parallel between evolution design and machine that you have in computational or artificial intelligence because in both cases you have a designer in one mm -hmm. case it's the algorithm of evolution in the other case it's the human derived algorithm that has some reward function mm -hmm. that's set inside of it and so yeah, you see be... oh go ahead I was just say, or it could be the desires of the of the agents. You know, if you look at uh, bones, for example, you know, it's a similar kind of a dynamic thing, and and the design of bones actually arises ultimately from um, a tendency of of actors uh, in the system, agents, namely the cells that uh, that both construct and break down bone. Uh, trying to manage uh, the the strain that they the mechanical strain they experience within certain limits. So, so the design of bones actually comes from a kind of strain homeostasis, and and you know maybe you could reduce that to an algorithm or not. I, I you know I, I I I don't know, but out of that comes apparently designed bones. You know they are structured in such a way as an engineer itself himself would uh, 
design them. So it doesn't necessarily have to be algorithms. I think you have to take into account uh, the desires and motivations, if you will, of the agents at play, just like you have to do with termites and the design of a termite mound. From all the computational people we've talked to, they basically deal with that by saying reward functions, because you can encode a reward, mm-hmm. you can encode a desire and a behavior inside of one mm-hmm. of these algorithms. And so I feel like there is a very mm-hmm. strong push to blur the the lines between biology and technology. And algorithms mm-hmm. accelerate that because what whereas we used to look at stuff mm-hmm. and say, well, the cell is like a machine and you can make an analogy to a mechanical clock. Now you can say that the organism is like an algorithm with reward functions, and that algorithm is designed by all of these other immaterial things like evolution and the ecological niche and the Mm -hmm. environment and and these interactions. And on some level, you can look at it and you can squint and you can kind of unfocus your eyes and you can see what they mean, Mm -hmm. because you can mathematically describe it that way. Mm -hmm. But then you're still left with the the physical substance of it, which is how does that feedback loop come to be set in such a way that you go from raw chemicals to whatever this is? Mm-hmm. Like that's the uh, there's no algorithm that can do that. There's no there's no starting conditions and no ending conditions that produces this that we can figure out yet. Yeah, I mean that's the big mystery, isn't it? And that's 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 one of the things that we, I think, are 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 missing by not having um, uh, an honest engagement with what purpose is and what uh, intentionality is and so forth. Okay, so you know you can certainly simulate uh, um, the behavior of something in an algorithm, um, and uh, in the case of um, uh, my original interest in physiology, uh, the regulation of body temperature, for example, um, uh, after the cybernetics uh, revolution started to take off after World War II, there was no shortage of of uh, of, uh, of flow diagrams and uh, metaphors for comparators and uh, and uh, those kinds of things that were coming out of the thermoregulatory literature. But the trouble was there that the simulated it over part of the range of function, but not over the entire range. And so what uh, that uh, mindset led to ultimately is that, okay, well, uh, we have an algorithm, but it's not quite the complete algorithm. So we'll just put in this new sub-algorithm, this new subroutine. And then uh, it's, it does better in some respects and does worse in others. And so what's the solution? You put in another subroutine and and uh, and so forth and so on. It, it, it becomes almost uh, almost the, uh, the, the, the proliferation of epicycles in the Ptolemaic model of the, of the, of the solar system. And <clears throat> it was originally motivated by, well, we know there's a temperature regulator because there's a part in the brain where we, if we manipulate the temperature, it causes certain things and uh, certain consequences and so forth. And then you had this proliferation of regulators to accommodate these algorithms, uh, these models, basically, of, of temperature regulation. First, it was there's something in the in the uh, aorta. There's an aortic thermoregulatory center. And then on and on and on and 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 ultimately you end up with this uh, with this algorithm where basically every cell is a regulating center you know in which case all right well you know have we have we uh, proliferated this algorithm approach to something that's approaching something completely the opposite of what you started out to do you know the original idea was here's the regulator system it explains certain things it's in the brain to more and more and more and more and then you eventually end up with every cell being essentially a thermoregulator of the body and and uh you know um have we improved our understanding of <laughs> thermoregulation uh because of the proliferation of these algorithms i i am not entirely sure about that i mean oh go ahead yeah, I mean, on one hand, it seems to serve the instrumentalization and like the product development and so forth. Like all these verifications are just, they are very productive and useful in engineering applications and technologically. But 
it seems like I think what we've just been circling around is just how important it is to protect the eyes and ears that scientists can serve in terms of making sense of what's actually going on. And that that has a real intrinsic value to society and civilization and really to our thriving and survival that can't be accounted for in terms of our ability to develop new products and new technologies. There's more to it. Not that those things aren't important. It's just that there's not, there's an increasingly, there's a shrinking space for science to be looking at things that aren't instrumentalizable in that technological sense. And so, you know. It's something leave we a have safe to, space um, for the crazy. It's, yes, it's, yes, it's <laughs> real. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you have uh, do you have some closing thoughts, some kind of bow that you can put on this for us? Um, I would say that. Um, well, the 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 title of my third book, Purpose and Desire, was actually a play on Jacques Monod's uh, book, Chance and Necessity. It was meant to set up a contrast to that and. I think that um, biology, the science of biology, is facing a crisis, not only an intellectual one, but a, but an identity crisis as well. Uh, and it's in part because we don't really, we're, we're not really comfortable with the idea of being vitalist, namely that there is something actually unique about life that distinguishes it from the physical and chemical environment that it exists in. And and uh, I think that the uh, path to progress in biology is going to ha- be to um, have an independent and scientifically credible idea about what purpose is, what intentionality is, and what intelligence is, because life ultimately is intelligent. I love that. I would love to have you come back down the line. These are questions that we spend a lot of time thinking about, and this was super, super illuminating. Yeah, we have we kind of have an open conversation going with Michael Levin about the uh, some of these same mm-hmm. topics too. Like Nick yeah. Lane, mm-hmm. Lee yeah. Cronin, like these are th- mm-hmm. there's all these people that are kind of coming at it from different directions. Mm-hmm. Well, I had a wonderful time, and I'd be happy to come on again. It was uh, great talking to you guys, and as well as you know, if you want to do something with a couple of us together, that would be fun as well. So, mm. yeah, we're working towards yeah. that. We're uh, yeah, we, we hope mm-hmm. to do more of that in the future for sure we're yeah. uh we're planning a conference in april of next year in austin texas we're, we're coinciding yeah. it with the eclipse on the 7th and the 8th oh okay. and so we're bringing together basically people from all different fields to uh-huh. give to uh-huh. give like 20 minute talks maybe and we'll have two days of talks and some intellectual that sounds, sessions. A, that sounds fascinating so we'll, we'll send you some info and so if, you, if you're interested maybe we can come see you in austin Please do. Yes, I would like to do that. Fantastic. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, it's been a real joy to meet you. And me too. I hope this isn't the last time. Great. All right. Okay. I don't think. Great rest of your day. All right. Bye, folks. Same to you. Goodbye.